Malaria, Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance, and Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network.
Yeah, just
A very good morning. Welcome to the WHO Southeast Asia Regions 2022 World Malaria Day Commemorative Seminar. We will begin our seminar with an opening address from our regional director, Dr. Poonam Khetrapal Singh. Honorable Health Ministers, from Bangladesh, Bhutan, DPR Korea, India, Indonesia, Maldives, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Timor Leste, distinguished representatives from the ministries of health, experts and partners, and representatives from the Global Fund, Gates Foundation, USAID, Rollback Malaria, Asia-Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance and Asia-Pacific Malaria Elimination Network, Medicines for Malaria Venture, BRAC, Save the Children, UNICEF, WHO Collaborating Centers, WHO Colleagues from Headquarters, Regional and Country Offices. Warm greetings and welcome to this World Malaria Day celebration. The theme of this year's global event highlights the need to harness innovation to reduce the malaria burden and save lives, a theme which fits well with the region's sustain, accelerate, innovate vision. For several years now, global progress against malaria has stalled and in some countries reversed, a trend that has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The latest World Malaria Report highlights an estimated increase in global cases of around 14 million, as well as an additional 69,000 deaths in 2020 when compared to 2019. While about two-thirds of the additional deaths were linked to pandemic-related disruptions, the remaining one-third of deaths reflect a recent change in WHO methodology for calculating malaria mortality. In view of recent data and trends, two critical milestones of WHO's global technical strategy for malaria have been missed reducing malaria case incidence and death rates by at least 40% by 2020 compared to 2015 levels. It should therefore come as no surprise that progress towards the Sustainable Development Goal target of ending malaria globally by 2030 is also off track. The picture in our region, which accounts for 38% of the malaria burden outside of the WHO African region, is somewhat brighter. By the end of 2020, we were the only WHO region that reached the Global Technical Strategy 2020 milestones of a 40% reduction in malaria case incidence and mortality. Three countries in our region accounted for 99.7% of the estimated cases. Remaining member states have either eliminated 
or moving closer to elimination. In 2020, Bhutan, TPR Korea, Nepal and Timor Leste reported zero indigenous malaria deaths, while both Maldives and Sri Lanka maintained their malaria-free status. Despite minor setbacks, eliminating malaria by 2025 continues to be a real possibility in the five countries of the region actively pursuing it, namely Bhutan, DPR Korea, Nepal, Thailand and Timor Leste. In 2020, the region had 5 million estimated cases and 8,900 estimated deaths, which means compared to 2010, there was a reduction of 80% in cases and 77% in malaria deaths, representing the largest decline in any of the WHO regions. As a region, we have made massive achievements achievements of which we can be immensely proud. We nevertheless have a long way to go to eliminate malaria in all countries of the region by or before 2030, in line with the region's 2017 ministerial declaration on accelerating and sustaining malaria elimination, as well as the 2018 ministerial call for action to eliminate malaria in the greater Mekong sub-region. Over the years, the region has witnessed either a stagnation or at times a reduction in overall funding, contrary to the undeniable need for an increase in funding necessary for malaria elimination. Thus, the region is at a crossroads in the response to malaria elimination and the situation demands a higher level of advocacy. Together, we must continue to accelerate implementation of the key strategic interventions of the Regional Action Plan 2017-2030, including first, ensuring universal access to malaria diagnosis and treatment by enhancing and optimizing case management. Second, ensuring universal access to malaria prevention by enhancing and optimizing vector control. Third, transforming malaria surveillance by increasing the sensitivity and specificity of surveillance systems to detect, characterize, and monitor all cases and manage foci. And fourth, accelerating efforts to attain and maintain elimination in all countries of the region. High burden countries with diverse geographical and population context must take some national and locally relevant approaches, ensuring a speedier trajectory that prioritizes the hard to reach and underserved and those at risk of being left behind. Cost corrections will be required in such high burden countries and for this, increased funding will be essential. Member states that have eliminated malaria must be better supported to remain malaria free with a focus on preventing the importation of new cases. Member states that are within reach of elimination must be supported in achieving and sustaining their goal. In such low burden countries, disease surveillance will be a vital tool to prevent a resurgence, especially in border areas. The focus of a key meeting in December 2021, which was supported by the Royal Government of Bhutan. Across each of these areas, investment and innovation will continue to be crucial with a focus on new vector control approaches, as well as better diagnostics and antimenarial medicines. 
drug resistance must be addressed sooner rather than later. I thank countries and partners for their ongoing support and I reiterate my support to you in turn. I urge all stakeholders to not just sustain but accelerate momentum, leveraging the full impact of existing tools while continuing to look ahead towards the innovation pipeline. I wish you an engaging and inspiring event and look forward to continuing to drive lasting change towards a malaria-free region and a malaria-free world. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. We will now have a message from Honorable Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Namaste. Dear Poonam Khetrapal Singh, Regional Director, WHO Southeast Asia Region, my colleague Minister from Southeast Asia Region, Excellencies and Distinguished Guests, India acknowledges this year's theme of innovations for malaria elimination in India. As we believe that, innovations will accelerate progress towards malaria elimination and transform surveillance into a core intervention for malaria elimination. The journey of India from high burden to high impact has been quite challenging. As you are aware that, as per the World Malaria Report 2021, India has one of the highest malaria burdens in the Southeast Asia region, accounting for about 83% of all malaria cases in the region in 2020. But at the same time, as per the same report, India was the only high burden to high impact country in Southeast Asia region that reported a decline in malaria cases in 2020 as compared to 2019. Few of the following, like early diagnosis and complete treatment, case-based surveillance and rapid response, integrative vector management, including long-lasting insecticidal nets, epidemic preparedness and response, monitoring and evaluation, behavior change communication and community mobilization and program planning and management have been part of the malaria elimination strategy in India. Dear colleagues and uh, delegates, I would also like to share that during the last six years, 97 million long-lasting insecticidal nets have been distributed in the high malaria endemic areas. Government of India motivated the local and sub-national government by instituting awards to district states for achieving zero indigenous case status and maintaining its for three consecutive years. India has shown exemplary success in malaria reduction by strategic intervention, which have been globally recognized and appreciated. India can be an example for other high endemic nations to promote cross-learning between India and other high burden countries. India would be happy to share its experience and expert expertise in malaria control 
with other countries dear ministers and delegates we must rem remember that the road of a malaria free country by 2030 is paved with several challenges like transfer migration of infection across international borders insecticidal resi resistance and spread of disease in hard to reach areas etc india has been conducting various bilateral cross border meetings at program directors level with neighboring countries like bhutan bangladesh nepal and sri lanka to develop a coordination mechanism between countries and implement the strategies to achieve malaria elimination across the borders i believe that such international collaboration based on knowledge sharing can help in elimination of malaria at a faster pace india in its future endeavors plans for implementation of web based portal for reporting enhanced surveillance in low endemic districts capacity building through establishment of its national reference lab and e training module for health workers we are also leveraging on health and wellness centers to be given the mandate for malaria elimination activities the government is exploring ways of mapping and inclusion of private sector strengthening of the lab capacities for malaria microscopy and development of sub national plans considering the epidemiological situations and challenges colleagues i would like to reaffirm that the government of india remains committed to malaria free southeast asia and also the asia pacific region as also expressed by our honorable prime minister shri narendra modi ji taking this opportunity i call upon country leaders development partners and donor agencies to own the vision of malaria elimination realize the responsibility and pledge that together we can make it happen so that people do not suffer from this preventable and curable disease and they are our ted and we emerge stronger in terms of socio economic development thank you jai hind i want to thank the honorable minister dr mansukh malviya for his remarks as we look ahead to how the region can become free of malaria we will in the next session have a look at the progress made since 2017 ministerial declaration on accelerating and sustaining malaria elimination in the southeast asia region was made and see the progress made in each of our member states now before we proceed to the next session and the subsequent discussions i would like to now outline to you the objectives of this seminar the general objective is taking the opportunity of the world malaria day 2022 to increase awareness amongst the different stakeholders to accelerate towards malaria elimination within the context of high burden to high impact we have two specific objectives for today's meeting one is to reemphasize and refocus on malaria elimination among public health administrators and managers to sustain the gains accelerate accelerate the progress and innovate to improve and expand service delivery through sharing evidence of of best practice within the context of high burden to high impact 
to highlight the importance of strengthening subnational elimination, to stress the need for better financing and governance for accelerating towards malaria elimination. I would also like to briefly outline to you on the different sessions which we have. The next session would be a renewed commitment, uh, state commitment for malaria free Southeast Asia region by 2030. This will be followed by session three, which looks at the malaria elimination, looking at the global and the regional perspectives. And we have two presentations from, from colleagues and experts. Then we move on to the, we will have a break for 10 minutes. That's, that's around 11.20 India time. And then we move on to the session on the best practices in malaria elimination within the context of the high burden and high impact. And we have taken three case studies, which will be presented to you by the respective uh, speakers from those projects. This will be followed by a panel discussion on, on how best practices can be replicated for acceleration of malaria elimination in the different countries. Uh, as mentioned in the specific objectives, there are two areas which we will focus on. One is the cross-border collaboration and also subnational elimination. And this, uh, this uh, panel discussions will be finally followed by the closing remarks. So before we move to the session two, uh, just wanted to also state that the pandemic has modified circumstances under which most meetings are being conducted. And we have requested each of the honorable ministers of health from the member states of the region to record their statements addressing this meeting. Each of these statements will be made available in the meeting links that will be provided and resources folders online. In the following video presentation, which will come up shortly, we will see how the country level progress as well as the leadership commitments from each of them as well as from the partners who have joined us today. Today, we will first start with a video presentation and subsequently we will call on the partners to make a brief statements of support. Thank you. Malaria continues to be a persistent public health threat in the WHO Southeast Asia region. However, due to consistent efforts of the member states, the past decade witnessed a significant reduction in active cases from 3 million a year in 2010 to half a million a year in 2020. Further, between 2010 and 2016, the reported malaria cases in the region fell by 48%, while malaria deaths declined by 60%. During this period, Maldives in Sri Lanka were certified as malaria-free by WHO. While this is impressive progress at a regional level, much work remains to be done at national and subnational levels to achieve the 2030 goal of eliminating malaria. The 2017 ministerial commitment to achieve zero malaria in the region recognized the need to intensify efforts, particularly around early diagnosis and treatment delivery at the community levels, improved surveillance for addressing disease transmission around sub-national and national administrative borders, addressing emergence of drug resistance, and scaled-up financing. The Regional Action Plan for a Malaria-Free Southeast Asia Region launched in 2017 provided milestone-driven plan in the region. Member states also created and updated their national action plans to align with the commitment to end malaria in the region by 2030. Five years into the operationalization of the action plans, we take a quick look at progress made in each member state and hear from honorable ministers of health their resolve to see the end of malaria by 2030. In the past decade, Bangladesh has achieved major success in reducing malaria transmission throughout its endemic areas, witnessing an 85% reduction in malaria cases from 2015 to 2020. At present, the malaria burden in Bangladesh is fairly concentrated in the three Chittagaon Hill Tracts districts of Kagrachari, Rangamati and Bandarban, which account for 92% and 82% respectively of P. falciparum and P. vivax. 
our country's malaria burden is fairly concentrated in the three Chittagong Hill districts of Khagrachuri, Rangamati and Bandarban, which account for 93% of malaria cases detected in the country's 13 endemic districts. About 71.7% of the cases in the country are in the Bandarban district alone. All our malaria endemic districts share borders with either India or Myanmar. And the areas with the highest malaria caseload tend to be forested, difficult to reach areas inhabited by mobile and migrant populations such as Jhum, cultivators, forest goers, etc. and ethnic minorities who are often socially, economically deprived. In the past decade, Bangladesh has achieved major successes in reducing malaria transmission throughout its endemic areas despite a spike of transmission in 2013 and 2015, which has again been effectively controlled. Overall, an 89% reduction in malaria cases and a 76% uh, reduction in deaths has been reported from 2010 to 2020. The country is making steady progress towards the goal of malaria elimination through a geographically phased approach. With 80% of its districts being free of malaria and 17% of districts having an annual parasite incidence of less than one per thousand population, the country could well achieve elimination even before the targeted year of 2030. We look forward to a malaria-free Bangladesh. Bhutan stands on the verge of eliminating malaria in the kingdom. From a total of 448 malaria cases reported in 2010, incidence has come down 54 in 2020, with only 6 of the 54 cases being classified as indigenous cases. The rest of the cases are either imported or introduced, highlighting the main barrier that Bhutan faces in reaching the elimination goal. Importation of malaria from neighboring districts of India. Our region has the world's second highest malaria burden. Although malaria mortality has fallen, we are far from achieving the last mile of elimination. Bhutan has made unprecedented progress and achieved a significant reduction in malaria mortality and morbidity till date. Malaria caseload has dropped to nine indigenous cases in 2021 from 39,000 cases in 1990s. Bhutan reaffirms its commitment to implement the WHO operational framework for cross-border collaboration that was developed in consultation with member states and partners. With only P. vivax being endemic in the Democratic People's Republic DPR, of Korea, the country aims to eliminate malaria by 2025. The 10 years from 2010 to 2020 have seen an 87% decrease in the reported malaria incidence in the country, from 13,520 cases in 2010 to 1819 in 2020. The well-established public health system allows the country to follow a strict 1, 2, 5 timing schedule. Cases are treated within a day of detection, and case investigation is begun within two days. A response is mounted within five days by way of contact tracing, active case detection and vector control. The long incubation period of P. Vivax parasites has mandated mass primaquine therapy as a means of preventing infection during the next transmission season. Primaquine is also administered as supervised treatment to malaria. Patients to ensure adherence to this 14-day anti-relapse medication. Personal protection is given a key place in the elimination strategy. This includes the use of LLINs, long-lasting insecticide-treated nets, and insecticide-treated clothing for those at risk. With hindsight of the Korean Peninsula's experiences with success in eliminating malaria. From DPR Korea in the early 1970s we are very much committed to eliminating malaria from DPR Korea. 
and look forward to see all member countries of the Southeast Asia region eliminate this disease. India has made remarkable progress since the turn of the century, showcasing a reduction of 73% and 84% in annual parasite incidence from 2010 to 2018 and 2015 to 2020 respectively. This massive reduction in disease burden has been achieved through concerted scale-up efforts of malaria interventions in general. Coverage with long-lasting insecticide-treated nets was vastly expanded as a transmission control measure and service delivery for case management was also improved at the community level by recruiting accredited social health activists, that is ASHAs, who effectively provided prompt point-of-care diagnosis and treatment for malaria at the community level in rural India. This scale-up of services delivered through public sector channels has improved the standard of care and consequently a 49% decrease in deaths was reported in just a year from 2017 to 2018. हमें 2030 तक देश को मेलेरिया से मुक्त करना है इसलिए एक व्यापक कार्य योजना निश्चित की ओर से भी बनाई जा रही है आने वाले दिनों में मेलेरिया नाबूद के लिए भी बड़ा अभियान चलाना है और टारगेट के समय में हमें गोल को अचीव करना है Number 1. Constituting the most wide-ranging eco-epidemiology of malaria, Indonesia is endemic to no less than 26 species of mosquito vectors transmitting malaria. Despite these contextual challenges, Indonesia has approached elimination through a sub-national approach and has reduced the total malaria burden in the country by a significant 63% from 2010 to 2018 and 20% from 2015 to 2020. Number 2. About 74% of the malaria case load in Indonesia is from the province of Papua that currently reports a very high annual parasite incidence of 59 per thousand. At present, Indonesia is undergoing a health system transformation. The objective of these transformations is to achieve the visions of a healthy, productive, self-sufficient and just community by 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of the primary care transformation, Indonesia is on track to eliminate malaria by 2030. Today, there are 347 districts out of 514 districts in the country, which are verified as malaria-free by the Independent National Committee on Malaria Elimination. Therefore, 85% of 270 million Indonesia population now live in malaria-free areas. We are continuously improving the quality of the malaria program to achieve high impacts and success in eliminating malaria transmission in all parts of the country, especially at high burden districts. To accelerate progress, the government, in collaboration with United Nations agencies, non-governmental organizations, and private sectors, have developed strategies. The year of 2022 brings hope to us all. We believe that our efforts in transforming our healthcare systems to perfect the first line of defense in early detection and control of malaria can bring us one step closer to a malaria-free world. COVID-19 has taught us that together, nothing is more to make a difference. Thank you. Maldives is currently free of malaria vectors and therefore has a very low receptivity to the disease. However, the risk of malaria vectors being reintroduced and re-established remains, including that of the highly effective urban vector Anopheles stephensi. Continuous vigilance with entomological surveillance is required. This is particularly important because the vulnerability of the country to malaria being reintroduced is high, owing to infected tourists entering the country as well as part of the imported workforce. With a population dispersed across the ocean into 186 island communities. Despite these challenges, we have been able to sustain our malaria elimination status, which we first achieved in 1984, followed by a certification by WHO that declared Maldives as a malaria-free country. I'm proud to say that the Maldives is currently free of malaria vectors and therefore 
have a very low receptivity in the disease. However, the risk of malaria vectors being reintroduced and re-established remains a strong possibility. With constant introduction of highly infectious vectors such as Enophile Stephensi, it is a relief that malaria is no longer a significant health problem and that its re-establishment is being prevented within the context of an integrated health system. Malaria diagnosis and treatment is conducted under the purview of the general health care delivery system through the National Immunization Program of our public health purveyors, the Health Protection Agency. We await the day when all member states of the WHO Southeast Asia region are certified as having eliminated malaria and remain committed to sharing our experiences. Despite multiple vulnerabilities, Myanmar continues to witness a steady momentum towards malaria. Elimination From January to November 2021, Myanmar recorded 53,314 cases of malaria, a 3% decrease. Compared with the same period in 2020.10 of these, 7,322 were P. falciparum mixed cases, a 49% decrease from the same period in 2020. In 2020, Myanmar developed guidelines that outlined the country's approach to maintaining malaria activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. WHO, partners, and Myanmar's National Malaria Control Program regularly conducted program criticality exercises to plan activities, taking into account both the pandemic and the evolving security situation. However, delayed outbreak reporting, stockouts of anti-malarials, problems in supply, chain logistics, disruptions in the provision of drugs, tests and LLINs to communities, shared. National borders are the key factors driving increased transmission in Myanmar. With a reported case incidence of 3,115 in 2010, Nepal's malaria program within the Epidemiology and Disease Control Division of the Department of Health Services scaled up interventions to bring down cases by 83% from its 2010 values and 76% from its 2015 values to 2020. This again demonstrated that when moving towards elimination, the last and residual burden of malaria can be difficult to overcome and requires synergistic efforts across geographies. Number 2. Almost half of Nepal's malaria cases are reportedly imported from neighboring countries. Due to unhindered Nepalese population moving across the border and returning with malaria. Malaria transmission in Nepal has been significantly declining and now is confined to the certain focal areas. Scaling up of national malaria program yields a 96% decline in malaria cases during last decade. Cross-border collaboration initiative of WHO regional office through greater cooperation between countries sharing common borders will provide a great benefit to Nepal. National strategic plan 2014 to 2025 has set a realistic goal of achieving malaria elimination by 2025. Nepal is committed to strengthen the surveillance systems to respond to the residual challenge of malaria. We look forward to working with all partners and member states to attain the vision of a malaria-free WHO South East Asia region. Thank you. Sri Lanka's experience with malaria presents several important lessons for other countries in the region. Number one, elimination of malaria can be achieved with currently available tools, provided there is a good leadership at the national level and expertise and skills at the district level to use local data for effective malaria control. The return of malaria in epidemic proportions after near elimination in 1963 is a reminder of how vulnerable countries in the SEA region are to the resurgence of malaria unless efforts are sustained. The single case of introduction of malaria in 2018 is a warning that substantial investments in preventing the re-establishment of malaria will be essential in countries post-elimination, at least until the entire region is free of malaria.
Sri Lanka's long and harrowing experience with malaria for centuries has been started with success of near elimination in 1963 and failures. Seeing the return of the disease in epidemic proportions thereafter and all this culminated 50 years later with the outstanding achievement of elimination of the disease. Sri Lanka's experience with malaria presents several important lessons for the other countries in the region. Elimination of malaria can be achieved with currently available tools provided there is good leadership at the national level and expertise and skills at the district level to use local data for effective malaria control. The fact that the country achieved elimination despite an ongoing internal armed conflict which spanned 30 years in highly malarious province has shown that heavy odds too can be defeated in achieving the goal. The return of malaria in epidemic proportions after near elimination in 1963 is a reminder of how vulnerable countries in the Southeast Asian region are to the resurgence of malaria unless efforts are sustained. The single case of introduce of malaria in 2018 is a waiver in that substantial investment in preventing the re-establishment of malaria will be essential in countries post elimination at least until the entire region is free of malaria. Thailand, a part of the Greater Mekong subregion, had freed 45% of its districts of malaria by 2018. There being low transmission in the rest of the districts, the country is well on its way to achieving the goal of elimination. Since 2012, the malaria caseload has been reduced by 85% and that of P. falciparum by 95%. having been the focus of multidrug resistant p falciparum parasites over the years including the emergence of artemisinin resistance at its border with cambodia these achievements are all the more significant the residual burden of malaria in thailand is at its borders with cambodia myanmar and malaysia and the central part of the country has been freed of malaria transmission thailand's National Malaria Elimination Strategy 2017 to 2026 is based on consolidating these achievements to progress to end local transmission of malaria in the country by 2024, which is also well within the targets established by the Greater Mekong Subregion's malaria elimination effort. We reiterate Our support to the 2017 commitment to eliminate malaria in the WHO Southeast Asia region by 2030 and to seeing Thailand achieving this in line with our strategic plan. We expect that when our national elimination goals are eventually reached, Thailand will serve as an example for both achieving and then maintaining a malaria-free state in a highly integrated health system which is the country's model starting from a very high malaria burden of 223,000 cases in 2006 in a population of just over 1 million the malaria landscape in timor leste has dramatically changed in the past 15 years while no malaria deaths have been reported since 2015 the last Indigenous case was reported in June 2017. Only 8 cases of malaria, all imported, were reported in 2018. Attention to detail, such as the quality control of malaria diagnosis and training of dedicated malaria staff under excellent technical guidance, were the hallmarks of the country's program. Os participantes, moras malaria ne behagu ko numero astebes, ko numero Kakazu rihun atau serua ruanu resintolu ia tinan rihun ruanein ia nasaun nebe ho populasi tahun besi pinjau ida makti molesti atau ruanu desempenyu servisu ia programa malaria besi to fase eliminasaun ita beredihan servisu nebe mak extraordinario ikus mai misi da saudi atinsi metas nebe defini kude redus moras malaria kude tasha insidensi anual Paparazita 0,001 ia tinan di jurua sanulu resinitu. Suksesu ne admirado liutan tamba hari ba frontera terestre boto Indonesia parte timor occidental ne be endemik ba moras malari. Hoax solok tebis atau fah informasi kata 
Hau, o Excelência Ministro da Saúde da Indonésia, assina uma nota de entendimento de Janabé, inclui colaboração entre a fronteira de com o assunto de Sierra Hanessa, malária, no Hau Fierkata, com colaboração no serviço de mútuo, se for benefício para a mútuo. Que em Cata, que ele atinge o controle do amor às malária, acelera o esforço toma com assistência técnica de Janabé, com qualidade as Pusi OMS, região sudeste asiático, no MOS, OMS e Timor-Leste, não reforça a inovação, pode garantir esforço toma, pode eliminar moras malária e a Timor-Leste, por sucesso. Obrigada, Bala. The trend line for success in malaria elimination in the region has been possible due to the strong commitment from the political leadership and steady support of our diverse partners to further the vision of a malaria-free region. WHO SEARO assures a continued technical support to member countries, monitor and follow up on the national progress, take precise measures for border malaria, and ensure system strengthening by data monitoring and assured access to anti malarials. We have seen the excellent remarkable progress made by each of the member states of the WHO Southeast Asia region and also heard from the honorable ministers of health of their continued leadership and commitment to eliminate malaria from the countries and from the region. We are privileged to have with us His Excellency Mr. Choi Hui Chol, Ambassador of the Demo Democratic People's Republic of Korea in India, who will share a few remarks on progress made by the country. Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, uh, Madam Regional Director, Dr. Punam Ketra Singh, distinguished partners and participants. I'm very much pleased to have my speech in a World Malaria Day 2022 commemorative virtual seminar on malaria high burden to high impact. On this day, the member states of WHO Southeast Asia region are urged to attain the goals of malaria elimination in the region by keeping malaria high on the political agenda and mobilizing additional resources. In previous years, the government of DPR Korea was giving a priority to malaria elimination and achieved a lot of successes from past elimination activities. Even amid global COVID-19 pandemic, the government continues to strengthen malaria elimination activities in the country, especially for early diagnosis and prompt treatment of malaria cases. Active case detection is being conducted on a regular basis in all health facilities from central to peripheral levels by strong, well-established health system. First of all, IEC DCC activities for population living in endemic areas were strengthened so that they could be aware of malaria risk and respond to it, which led to strengthening of community participation and empowered communities to take ownership of malaria prevention and care. In addition, mass primoquine preventive therapy for eliminating malaria infection sources and use of long-lasting insecticidal bed nets, insecticide residual spraying, and insecticide-treated clothing for vector control have been scaled up. In line with programmatic requirements of malaria elimination phase, case and focus-based surveillance and interventions were conducted, and as part of public campaigns, environment management for removing mosquito breeding sites such as filling up the pools and drainage of water channels was also done. These intensified efforts brought a reduction of malaria cases in 2021 by approximately 15% compared to 10 years ago. And as of now, the DPR Korea has the prospect to eliminate malaria in the near future. However, global COVID-19 pandemic has seriously impacted the implementation of elimination program, especially it has impeded timely delivery of malaria control supplies, such as malaria di diagnostics, drugs, and insecticides, 
which led to non-implementation of key interventions planned. Therefore, we think that new and innovative Innovative strategies are required in the context of global COVID-19 pandemic. All member states are committed to fully implementing them and provide sustainable supports within the region. Thankful to great efforts of all health workers within the region who are devoting themselves to the fight against global COVID-19 pandemic, I'd like to express my home conviction that mankind will surely win a war with this virus in forthcoming years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your statement. The work of eliminating malaria is a shared one between national programs, community-led level actions, and support from technical and financial partners. We will now hear from some of our partners who have been able to join us this morning. I will first invite Dr. Corinne Karima, the interim CEO of Rollback Malaria Partnership, who joins us from Geneva. Thank you very much. So I'm joining you from Kigali, Rwanda, in Africa. So first of all, thank you for extending the invitation to Rollback Malaria. And uh, the World Malaria Day, uh, as you all know, it's an opportunity uh, for the global community to collectively raise uh, our voices in union to keep malaria high on the high level agenda, as well as to the global health uh, agenda. So I'd like, first of all, to thank WHO for this really important uh, event. It's a very timely event reminding us that malaria is still affecting the Southeast uh, Asia region, uh, despite uh, all the impressive progress as shown by uh, uh, all the, the, the countries. So honorable ministers of health, distinguished uh, representatives, uh, partners, uh, the global malaria community, research institution, uh, of course, uh, WHO, Madam Regional Directors, as well as uh, all the WHO representatives and the experts who are here. So we have seen that um, uh, the, 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 the Southeast Asia region has shown really progress and uh, we all know uh, you have shown all the data. We are at a precarious uh, juncture for malaria because as you know, with uh, the COVID disruption, uh, the gains uh, in malaria control have been jeopardized uh, for the last decades. And uh, that's why uh, this event is really important because it's really reminding us that malaria fights does not stop until we have reached a full elimination. And that more than ever, it's really a question of uh, equity. So for us, the global Malaya community, as well as the global uh, partnership, uh, Southeast Asia region is really setting a really good example of progress despite all the, these challenges. And first of all, uh, thanks to uh, the strong commitment and leadership of countries uh, as really uh, seen in this video uh, with the support of partners, including uh, all the area efforts from community health workers, as well as the whole health sectors. Uh, we have seen that there was no increase in malaria uh, burden in this region between 2019 and 2020. And I, I know that WHO colleagues will really show uh, all, uh, all the data uh, despite the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The second one is really the political will, which, which is really highlighted through this, uh, as you know, the high burden, high impact approach. It has been really well demonstrated uh, in the countries uh, within the region. And thanks to that, we have seen the decline of malaria death uh, for the last 20 years. And uh, really thanks to this impressive work and the investment of key actors, including uh, the Global Fund, the Presidential Malaysia Initiatives, the Bill, Melinda, Bill uh, and Melinda Gates Foundation and others, as well as uh, the significant uh, domestic resource commitment for, from countries. And uh, we have seen that this region can eliminate malaria by 2030. And uh, we have examples like Sri Lanka, uh, with the existing tools, they've been declared malaria-free uh, since uh, 2016. So we all know uh, countries and communities are at the center of ineffective uh, malaria response. 
uh, as uh, said by uh, most of the, 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 the panelists and the presenters, countries can adopt innovative approaches to partnership as well as financing. They can adopt innovative tools and take uh, a targeted approach to deliver malaria uh, intervention, of course, improve service delivery and strengthen the, the health system. And the COVID, most importantly, the COVID has shown that uh, we need to reinforce and invest in real time data. And it's really vital for effectively uh, fight uh, this disease. And uh, we at uh, the Hold Back Malaria and Partnership, we are dedicated to support countries to take a multi-sectorial approach, bring together different stakeholders at, of course, national, uh, subnational, regional to align to strategies and maximize resources and ultimately accelerate progress against uh, malaria. So by eliminating malaria, South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia countries will not only save lives from malaria, but they will reinforce the health system to better respond to other health challenges and be prepared for other uh, pandemic and emerging uh, diseases. So by raising our voices together, we can make the stronger case for how increasing investment in malaria can rapidly drive down malaria cases and death uh, in our countries while continuing to sprint towards elimination uh, in low burden countries like in Southeast Asia. So uh, by working together, we can end malaria and achieve a more equal uh, world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Karima. Now I invite Dr. Philip Belkov, the Director of Malaria at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here at this event. It is uh, really wonderful and encouraging to see the reports of continued progress uh, against malaria across the region uh, and the progress continuing thanks to the great work of member states and partners uh, despite the present uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, we do recognize that this progress is uh, fragile and that uh, malaria is an unforgiving disease with uh, many instances in history of, of, of resurgence if uh, the effort does not continue uh, to, to uh, push it down even further. So while there has been uh, notable and welcome positive progress, we do all recognize that it is critical to, to take a customized approach to reducing the malaria burden in the high burden countries uh, and moving them more towards the uh, route to elimination and to focus on accelerating towards elimination in the countries that are in the pre-elimination phase. Uh, doing both of these things uh, will require uh, improved data systems, as uh, Dr. Karina Karima called out, uh, an increased emphasis on, on real-time data and use of that data to drive the um, tailoring of mixes of interventions at that subnational level based on what is needed and based on uh, th those improved data. Uh, this, uh, in, this operational work and data work, uh, coupled with increased political and financial commitments from each, of these, uh, from each of the implementing countries. As we look across the region, uh, we, we collectively need to ensure that the progress made in the greater Mekong subregion towards elimination of both uh, Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax can be seen to completion. Uh, it is notable that the critical work in this uh, subregion has continued uh, despite the pandemic, and we are uh, deeply grateful to the member states, the uh, governments, partners, the, uh, the Global Fund, and the ongoing contribution via the RIE grant. Uh, we see continued progress in every uh, quarterly progress report from the WHO's uh, Mekong Malaria Elimination Program. And we encourage uh, each of uh, the governments in the subregion to increase domestic contributions and to continue to work uh, collectively towards an accelerated pathway to elimination. Uh, we also encourage all partners to continue working together to support on the uh, re-engagement of malaria activities in Myanmar. These elimination activities are critical, not only for Myanmar itself, but also for all the countries that share a border within the region. On the high burden country side, 
when we look at uh, the hybrid in countries such as uh, India and Indonesia, which have uh, demonstrated remarkable progress, um, despite, uh, again, despite the pandemic, we want to make sure that the work in these countries is supported effectively. Uh, given the context, the recent report just uh, uh, noted the, ex the extreme complexity and diversity of malaria epidemiology and, and ecology within Indonesia and a similar header and a detailed uh, heterogeneity of malaria within India. Uh, again, the subnational tailoring of interventions based on evidence and improved data and improved surveillance will be critical to reducing the burden of malaria and striving towards elimination. With respect to Indonesia, there is a great opportunity as uh, this year's president of the G20 to raise the visibility and uh, importance of the malaria elimination agenda. This is an opportunity to highlight where the remaining uh, malaria in the Asia Pacific is situated, uh, uh, what is the great progress that has been made and what is required to go from where we are now all the way to the end. Um, in, uh, within India, we are, we as at the Gates Foundation are very excited to have been recently engaged with the, uh, with India's National Malaria Program as requested by the Secretary of Health uh, to be members of teams for the Malaria Program Review, supporting World Malaria Act Day activities and uh, commencing investments in improve, in supporting vector surveillance, um, improved surveillance of treatment in the private sector and monitoring of anti-malarial uh, uh, resistance in the parasite. We will continue to uh, uh, respond to recommendations from the Malaria Program Review in, in that partnership. Uh, finally, we, we must ensure that uh, when countries are, are near elimination, such as Timor-Leste and Bhutan, that uh, governments, partners, and the region as a whole uh, work together to achieve the goals of elimination as quickly as possible for the countries that are aiming for 2025, that we achieve by 2025, building towards a successful uh, elimination of across the entire region by 2030. Um, as multiple speakers and uh, countries have pointed out, uh, progress even once elimination is achieved remains vulnerable until the entire region achieves uh, malaria-free status. Uh, this is possible. It, uh, the, the, the progress to date shows what can be done. And I am uh, delighted to see the partnerships uh, coming together to ensure that what is possible becomes a, achieved in reality. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you all and best wishes uh, to you all. And tremendous thanks for, for the great work that the member states, the uh, WHO regional office, RBM, APELMA, Global Fund, many other partners are doing to ensure uh, continued success and progress. Thank you very much, Dr. Velikov. Now I invite Dr. David Sintas, who is the Malaria Regional Advisor for USAID. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much um, for the opportunity um, to, to join this, this meeting. Um, and also to uh, provide a few few um, thoughts, um, just to add to to some of the the comments that have already been made um, by the previous um, speakers. Um, um, I, I think on behalf of the U.S. Um, uh, President's Miller Initiative, um, I, I am really uh, grateful, actually, um, to be a, a partner um, in this region, um, and to see all the great progress that's been made um, um, so far. Um, the, uh, the reduction of morbidity and mortality across the board, um, and also um, the, the issue of drug resistance, um, which had been highlighted as a, a, a uh, you know, uh, global threat. Um, and, and we all uh, were, were very, um, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> raising alarm bells um, um, with, with drug resistance. And I think um, to see that um, uh, with the support of WHO and other partners um, to uh, update treatment policies to monitor um, uh, therapeutic efficacies across um, many of the countries uh, have helped to, to address this issue. Um, and, and also now that um, plasmodium falciparum um, uh, is on the verge of elimination um, in the Asia Pacific region, so this is all really great progress um, and very, very encouraging. 
Um, I think I just wanted to, to add um, uh, on, on the points that had been made at, around um, stronger surveillance systems. Um, I, I think uh, over the past decade, we've seen many of the, the country programs have significantly improved um, data collection, um, improving uh, time, more timely reporting um, and, and use of, of the data. Um, uh, and, and, you know, Thailand, for example, um, is looking at innovative, way, innovative ways of integrating um, drug resistance information um, within the routine surveillance system. Um, and I think that that will help to um, uh, ensure that monitoring of drug resistance um, uh, is, is sustainable um, and, and maintained. Um, and then also, of course, implementation of strategies such as 137 um, and, and from North Korea, what we heard is a, a 125 approach. Um, I think um, having uh, timely, uh, uh, having uh, data and, and timely um, responses to uh, to malaria cases, I think will help us um, continue to accelerate um, and drive down down malaria. Um, and uh, I think, you know, despite all of these these uh, the, the progress that's been made, um, some of the challenges I think that have already been mentioned, um, uh, you know, include um, COVID um, and the disruptions of COVID. Um, but I I do think that. Um, uh, it presents us with an opportunity um, to, to learn from um, how countries have approached COVID, um, the all of government approach, um, the use of information as um, Dr. Crane had mentioned, um, uh, uh, real-time information, the, the I, technical, um, the IT uh, innovations that have been developed very quickly um, in response to COVID. I think those things um, can uh, benefit the malaria community um, as well as other infectious diseases, but I think uh, uh, learning from, from um, how uh, governments are using an, an all of government approach um, to address COVID, which I think um, uh, we, we should also um, uh, learn from and um, uh, perhaps be able to, to replicate um, in our goal to reach malaria elimination. Um, and, and also I think uh, uh, with COVID, we should we should try to leverage um, the the uh, uh, opportunities and also the, the available resources that are are being um, provided um, for the COVID response uh, to to uh, improve um, malaria uh, uh, activities. Um, so again, I, I would also just like to to re reiterate um, you know the the importance uh, for uh, countries to uh, increase their uh, domestic commitment um, and contributions, um, as well uh, as as uh, many countries uh, move towards malaria elimination, and um, there will be a need to 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 maintain uh, uh, the, maintain malaria elimination status. So, um, with that, thank you very much again for the opportunity to join this um, session and for me to provide a few remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sintas. Now we will now hear from Dr. Sartak Das, the CEO of the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance. Good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening. On behalf of the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance and Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network, I am honored to be addressing you on the occasion of this commemorative seminar, High Burden to High Impact, to mark World Malaria Day 2022. I would like to especially acknowledge Honorable Union Minister for Health, Dr. Mansouk Mandavia, as well as to thank Madam Dr. Poonam Singh for her leadership at WHO Sierra and for the opportunity to join you all today in speaking on the topic of the role of partners in advocacy. It is appropriate that I am speaking to you on this topic today when I am in Papua New Guinea, one of the last remaining high burden countries in Asia Pacific and one that is critical to achieving the 2030 malaria elimination goal. In answering the question of what is the role of partners in advocacy, 
I'm reminded of the words of Dr. Rudolf Virchow. Dr. Virchow, whom, as many of you know, is the father of modern day pathology, the founder of what we now call social medicine. He was much more than a physician and a scientist. He was a writer, an editor, and a politician. And Virchow is credited with saying that medicine is a social science and politics is nothing more than medicine on a large scale. I'd like to unpack that a bit. Medicine is a social science. The same holds true for public health. We know all too well that to fight malaria, we need to understand not just the clinical epidemiology, but the social epidemiology. We know that it is the pin code, postal code, or the zip code that you are born into that can structure your own susceptibility to the malaria parasite. It determines your access to the best tools and the capacities that we have to combat this disease. Which brings us to advocacy. The role of advocacy writ large is, of course, to ensure that the voices of those most affected are elevated so that government leaders, politicians can understand how their decisions on policy affect their constituents. At the same time, advocacy exists as a mechanism to be able to raise issues for the private sector to consider their obligations to the most vulnerable. Advocacy efforts are critical because they provide a glue, if you will, to form partnerships, coalitions, create momentum across disciplines, across sectors that are data-driven, that are founded upon normative guidance by governments and the World Health Organization, that are rooted in locally generated evidence, but that move beyond the realm of science alone and technical guidance to bring partners together and perhaps most importantly, create new funding opportunities or mobilize additional resources. One of the other most critical areas of the role of partners in advocacy is to make sure that we do not duplicate one another and that we seize upon opportunities as they present themselves to create moments and momentum to enable us to move forward to fight back this oldest pandemic and achieve malaria elimination in Asia Pacific by 2030. This is eminently possible. We know it has been achieved around the world with far fewer tools. And as the leader of an advocacy organization devoted to serving governments and elevate the voices of those who are most vulnerable, we look forward to working together with all of you in the months and years ahead in our journey towards elimination. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das. And I would also thank all the partners who have expressed their continued support to achieve the goal of elimination of malaria in the Southeast Asia region. As we have heard from the honorable ministers, the commitment to move forward and also the sustained support from the different partners, this signed statement, which was thus displayed, will of renewed commitment for malaria elimination in the Southeast Asia region, will provide us impetus to help move forward towards this goal in the Southeast Asia region. Thank you all. Now we will move to the our session three, where we have two pres presentations. One will be a presentation from a global perspective and the other from a regional perspective. The global perspective is brought to us by Dr. Andre Bosman, who is the acting director of the Global Malaria Program at WHO headquarters. Over to you, Dr. Bosman, please. Thank you, and um, excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share my screen if that's allowed. And uh, at the moment, uh, 
I have a message that I cannot share the screen. Okay. Uh, we you. can display the slides if it's okay for you. Yes, thank you so much. So next slide. The, the vision, um, if you can move to the next one. The vision of a world free of malaria is uh, included in the global technical strategy of malaria. And this has not changed and have been even uh, taken as uh, the, in the update, uh, which was uh, endorsed by the World Health Assembly last year. And in the text, uh, the World Health Assembly recommits to uh, the goal of malaria eradication and affirms that this goal will be incorporated in the post-2030 iteration of the global technical strategy. So the achievement of the reduction by 90% of malaria cases and death and elimination of malaria in 35 countries will be the platforms on which then to launch uh, continuous efforts to achieve a global eradication of malaria. Next. We have a, a trend in malaria cases which has been uh, decreasing dramatically up to 2015, but still we have today 241 million malaria cases in 85 endemic countries, 95% of this in the African malaria region. Next. And the malaria today is responsible for almost 8% of the mortality in children under five. And as already said, there has been a major increase of around 12% in 2020 compared to the previous years. Next. Now, if we look at the trend and of malaria recently and the trajectory to achieve the global technical strategy. This is shown in the green lines for cases on the left, death on the right side. You see that where we are today with the blue trends, we are totally off track by at least 40%, both in reduction of cases and mortality. Next. Now the, the situation is, uh, um, Certainly for some countries, uh, relatively good. And we heard in many countries in the region, they have uh, achieved and even exceeded the uh, target of uh, for 2020. But if we look at this map, uh, all countries which are in different shades of browns, uh, they are uh, off target. And in terms of mortality reduction, either they have a stagnation, no change, or even an increase in malaria mortality. Next. And um, there is a progress in uh, the elimination group of countries. Uh, more than half of the countries are uh, progressing towards elimination. And we have uh, 23 countries uh, which have uh, achieved uh, less than 100 cases in 2020. Next. Uh, maybe next, uh, this will be covered by other colleagues. I know Arian will be looking into this. If there is a progress in the elimination group of countries, but in the high burden countries, there are major setbacks. And uh, this is the cumulative numbers in cases, the upper graph or deaths, the lower graph for the high burden countries, the 11 countries. And with the exception of India, which had a massive progress, all the 10 high burden countries in Africa had a major increase in the burden. Next. The distribution is clearly skewed and we have a few countries, uh, uh, six countries accounting for 55% of malaria cases and uh, even four countries accounting for more than half of the malaria death. Next. And the, the, the intolerable burden of malaria is the mortality because malaria is a disease for which we can prevent entirely death. And 96% of all deaths are in the WHO African region 
which there's any little change in trends in the mortality in Africa is reflected quickly on the total burden of mortality. Next. Now the reasons for this, uh, I would quickly show some slides on coverage. This is use of insecticide treated nets uh, by children under five and pregnant women, which was the less than 50% mm -hmm. were using insecticide treated nets uh, according to household surveys done in Sub-Saharan Africa. And very concerning is the decrease uh, since 2017. In the next slide, we will show the reduction in coverage of insecticide uh, residual spraying with a reduction in the last 10 years uh, by half of the populations protected by IRS. The next slide will show access to uh, treatment for children under five uh, with fever, acute fever episodes and showing a difference between 2005-2011 household surveys done in sub-Saharan Africa with the more recent five years, you see there is really no change. And still around one third of children under five do not seek any treatment when they have a, a malaria, a, sorry, a, an acute febrile illness. The uh, supply of antimalarials uh, has been stagnating since 2013 in uh, most countries with uh, the distribution in the public sector. And if you look at the green bars, uh, this is the distribution in the private sector of quality assured ACTs through copayment mechanism. And this shows a massive reduction, especially since 2018, 19, and 2020. And it's a big problem because still a large proportion of malaria patients seek treatment in the private sector. Next. Now, in addition to the low coverage of many interventions, there has been the major uh, effect of the pandemic, which has created disruption of services, but also complex humanitarian and health emergencies have affected more than 120 million people in the last biennium, including armed conflicts and floodings. And to this, the problem of biological threats has also been added. We had the emergence of artemisinin in partial resistance in Africa, the increasing spread of um, HRP23 gene deletions, which affected the performance of RDTs, increasing pyrethroid resistance, uh, affecting therefore effectiveness of uh, long lasting nets and the invasive species Anopheles tifensi, especially in the Horn of Africa. And next uh, we'll see the, the trends in funding. And we are familiar that the situation has not evolved over the last 10 years with only up to one third of resources from domestic funds, the majority of funding coming from the US governments and other donors funding agencies, 75% of the international donor funds going through global fund or major bilateral initiative like PMI. And in spite of this good effort, uh, there is still a major financial gap, which is more than half for 2020. Uh, if we look at what was being uh, mobilized, dispersed, compared to what was estimated to achieve the 2020 GTS targets. Next. Now, there has been uh, the progress in the um, uh, elimination and uh, this together with uh, a major uh, good uh, let's, uh, achievement of the Millennium Development Goals in 2015 created a um, renewed interest by 2016-17 on the perspective of malaria eradication. There were several initiatives the Malaria Summit starting with and Malaria Council. There was a Lancet Commission for Malaria Eradication 
NWHO established the Strategic Advisory Group on Malaria Eradications. And um, these collective uh, groups of experts, uh, if you go to the next slide, were reflecting on the impact of uh, evolving <clears throat> big changes in <clears throat> natural and human megatrends with the uh, impact also of uh, continuous or increasing coverage of interventions. They looked at modeling efforts <clears throat> and uh, including the potential impact of uh, population growth, urbanization, climate change, change in land use and coverage and migration. This, they were looking into the changes by 2030 or 2050 of malaria endemicity. And here is showing the prevalence of pifalciparum in children by 2030 and 2050, you see a progressive reduction, even keeping the current level of interventions because of the additional impact of these mega trends. But even with this positive impact, there will be still large areas in West Africa, in the Southeast Africa with ongoing malaria transmission. The next slide will show if uh, on top of this mega trends, uh, the coverage of ITN, if you go to the previous one, please, there will be a uh, um, in further reduction if the increase of coverage is pushed um, to 80%, most of the parts of Africa will show very low transmission patterns with uh, many areas even reaching zero prevalence level. And if this in residual pockets, one could add the insecticide residual spraying at 80% um, coverage, many parts will have a very low uh, prevalence below 1%, but the scattered pocket of transmission will still remain in West and Africa and Southeast Africa. And similar also pockets in the Amazon region of South America. The next slide, they, the calculation also looked into changing this prevalence of infection into incidence. And while there will be a big reduction in incidence from 2017 to 2050, because of the impact of increased population growth, especially in the African continent, this will counteract the reduction in incidence. And more or less the number of malaria cases will be the same if the current level of interventions will not change. So above 200 million per year. If the coverage of current interventions are increased, then the numbers could be reduced significantly and up to 11 million estimated by 2050. And if one can add new tools, more long lasting and effective ACTs, monoclonal antibodies or different types of vaccines, these cases could be further reduced but without reaching zero cases according to model estimates. If you go to the next, this prompts to the need to have a, a major investment in a renewed research and development agenda to improve both the knowledge base, to have new interventions, and also to understand a new modality of implementing and to make more tailored intervention and most cost-effective. Now, this is a, a set of uh, the pipeline of innovative tools, which was uh, published in 2019 by the Lancet Commission. And as happens often with uh, many of the um, um, projections and pipeline, there is certainly many of these uh, products which have progressed, uh, but the timelines for final availability uh, has been moving. I will ask you please from the slides to move to the second slide that we skipped quickly. And that will be my last slide. If you can go quickly to the, no, go back to the second slide that was just after the title, please. 
I would like to end just with very good words from our director general, because he was a malariologist when he started his public health career. He was the program manager of uh, malaria in the Tigray state of Ethiopia. And he summarized here some of the key uh, conclusions of the strategic advisory group on malaria eradication. To say that WHO continues unequivocally to support the goal of malaria eradication. And uh, remembers that uh, there has been several commitments by member states uh, and that we should deliver on these promises to increase domestic and international investments on health, to focus first on the highest burden countries because that's where the maximum number of lives saved can be achieved, to invest in universal health coverage and prevent mortality soon because this is an achievable goal with the current tools that we have today and ensure an equitable access to both preventive and curative interventions. Now, if we deliver on these promises and there are investments in transformative new tools, then the world can achieve the health-related sustainable development goal and eradicate malaria. So this is my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bosman. Uh, from the regional perspective, is being brought to us by Professor Kamini Mendes. She's a professor, professor emeritus at University of Colombo and former malaria expert at the WA World Health Organization. Over to you, Professor Mendes, please. A very good morning to you, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this important seminar. With the renewed commitment to a malaria-free Southeast Asia region, let us now take stock of what the member states have achieved so far in their journey towards this goal. But let me uh, start with the briefest of a background. In 1998, WHO identified malaria as one of the key impediments to human health and development and launched a major global malaria initiative. Following this, in 2002, we saw the establishment of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria and thereby a massive increase in international funding for malaria. As countries began to make progress, WHO raised its goals from malaria control to elimination. And in 2015, WHO came up with the global technical strategy with agreed goals and targets for countries to move towards malaria elimination. Now, the WHO Southeast Asia region established its own goals for its member countries within the framework of this global initiative and in 2017 elevated expectations to the level of achieving zero malaria by the year 2030 to which the ministers of health of the member countries pledged their commitment which we saw renewed today in 2015 the greater mekong sub region to which two countries in the southeast asia region myanmar and thailand belong afflicted by anti-malaria drug resistance, also formulated a goal and strategy of its own to eliminate malaria by 2030. At the turn of the century, 10 out of 11 countries in the WHO Southeast Asia region, shown here in the map, were endemic for malaria. And 1.6 billion people in these countries were living under the risk of malaria. The WHO Southeast Asia region harbored half of the malaria burden outside of the African region, making it the second most malarious WHO region in the world. But over the past 20 years, the region has made impressive progress in reducing its malaria burden. Between the years 2000 and 2020, 
based on WHO's estimates of country malaria incidence derived from cases reported from individual countries, the case incidence in the region uh, fell from 18 cases per thousand population at risk to just three as shown by this uh, blue line. The total malaria cases were reduced by 78% from 22 million to 5 million. And this chart shows how the 10 countries individually reduced their malaria case numbers during the past 10 years. Correspondingly, the malaria mortality rate in the region also fell from 2.8 deaths per 100,000 population uh, in the year 2000 to 0 0.5 in the year 2020. The total malaria deaths were reduced by 75% uh, from 35,000 to 9,000. Thus, the Southeast Asia region became the only WHO region that reached the GTS 2020 milestones of a at least a 40% reduction in malaria case incidence and mortality compared to 2015 baseline. In fact, the region did even better than that. Because apart uh, from the countries achieving major reductions in malaria cases and deaths, one country, Sri Lanka, eliminated malaria and was certified uh, malaria-free by WHO in 2016 and remains malaria-free to date. Now, the Maldives, which had eliminated malaria in 1984 and had remained malaria-free since, also received WHO certification in 2015. Two other countries, Bhutan and Timor-Leste, made extremely rapid progress in moving towards elimination, starting from a very high case incidence as recently as 2010. Bhutan has been very near elimination for the past four years, reporting only six cases in 2018. Yet, importation of malaria across its borders is proving to be a, quite a challenge in getting to absolute zero. Timor-Leste did, in fact, interact malaria transmission in 2017 and sustained zero cases of malaria for two years. But unfortunately, in the third year and thereafter, a few cases of malaria have been reported jeopardizing its eligibility for WHO certification at the time. Now, Bangladesh, Nepal, Thailand, and DPR Korea, and, and DPR Korea, which is only endemic of plasmodium vivax malaria, all these countries reported a reduction in case numbers of over 85% in the past 20 years. This leaves the three large uh, high burden countries, Myanmar, India, and Indonesia, all of which also made impressive reductions in their malaria cases by 91%, 88%, and 41% reduction in cases, respectively, in the past 20 years. Now, countries, particularly in the latter two categories, are using a subnational approach to eliminate malaria. And large areas of these countries have now been freed of malaria. Some of the districts have never been endemic, but in many other districts, transmission has been interrupted during the past few years. This chart shows the proportion of districts in each of these countries that either have no malaria, the sections in blue, a very low incidence, the ones in gray, and high endemicity in, in, in the reds and oranges. For example, in 2018, Bangladesh and Indonesia, uh, in these two countries, 80 and 55% of the districts respectively were freed of malaria. In Thailand, 45% of its districts were free of malaria uh, in 2018, and the rest have a very low endemicity. And these countries will themselves validate the interruption of transmission at a subnational level. This is how uh, the reported malaria cases have been distributed in the region countrywise in the past few years, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, as you see here, the largest burden, not unexpectedly, is in the large countries. 97.6% of the total malaria cases in the region are now in Indonesia, India, and Myanmar. So countries in the region now fall broadly into four categories. Those that eliminated malaria, 
uh, whose challenge is to prevent re-establishment of the disease. Uh, this would be Maldives and Sri Lanka. Those who are only a step away from getting to zero, which is Bhutan and which are Bhutan and Timor Leste. Those that are making very good progress with the goal of elimination in the next few years. Uh, these countries are Bangladesh, Nepal, Thailand, and DPR Korea. And uh, the large and relatively uh, higher burden countries, Myanmar, India, and Indonesia, which are also making very good progress, but given their population sizes and highly diverse eco-epidemiology, will require more time to reach elimination. Now, yes, the COVID-19 pandemic did intervene. And although the downward trajectory of the malaria burden in the region continued throughout the pandemic, there is evidence that in most countries, surveillance activities were compromised during the pandemic and therefore may have masked any lack of progress or even small increase, increases in malaria during that period. So the Southeast Asia region has made an outstanding achievement in moving towards malaria elimination as no other region has. Now here's the Southeast Asia region performance compared to other regions uh, in green here. Now having come this far, what of the future? Will the region meet the WHO GTS targets? And will it in fact meet its own ambitious goal of a region free of malaria by 2030? Now let's see what the prospects are. These here are WHO's projections for the years to come for the malaria deaths in the Southeast Asia region. This continuous blue line shows the estimated total deaths per 100,000 population at risk up to 2020. And beyond this, the blue dotted line shows what the death rate would be if the current trajectory is maintained. Now in the green interrupted line above is the death rate if the GTS milestones were to be achieved. And similarly with malaria incidence here in this chart. This is the only WHO region in which, if the current tra trajectory is maintained, the region will exceed achieving the GTS targets. According to the current trajectory, the region as a whole is set to achieving the GTS goals by 2030. You see both lines meeting at uh, the 2030 year. However, before we get too cozy with the idea that we are on a very comfortable path, let me present a more realistic outlook. First of all, the WHO region's goal of zero is, is really zero malaria by 2030. And even by WHO projections, uh, the region will fall short of that. But that aside, the question is, can and will this trajectory be maintained by the region? And that is beset with some serious challenges. First of all, the case numbers reported by most countries, particularly in countries with a large burden, tend to be a gross underestimate of the true burden. This is because the malaria cases from the private health sector aren't included. And even the WHO estimates may not compensate adequately for that distortion. So in reality, we are left to deal with a higher caseload than we see reported or even estimated. Secondly, the last battlegrounds for malaria in the region will be the remote rural and even forested areas, such as the island of Papua in Indonesia, the border provinces of Myanmar, the very rural areas of India and the Chittagong Hill tracts of Bangladesh, where access to health services tend to be poor. And that is a tremendous challenge to eliminating malaria. Now, even countries which have come, a very, come very near elimination, such as Bhutan and Timor Leste, face a constant threat of malaria, malaria importation from across porous land borders which makes it dif a difficult task to meet the criteria for WHO certification. 
Nevertheless, the impressive achievements made in the Southeast Asia region countries themselves give more reason for hope than for despair. Uh, Sri Lanka and China, China is in the next, uh, uh, next region, uh, Western Pacific. These two countries with incredibly diverse backgrounds, both were successful in eliminating malaria with current tools. And that says a lot. A massive reduction of the malaria burden in the greater Mekong sub-region, to which two of the Sierra countries, Myanmar and Thailand, belong, as you will hear shortly from uh, Dr. Adrian Dondrop, is another reason for hope. And at least two countries in the region are on the brink of elimination. And it is therefore with hope that the countries are forging ahead for the region to be free of malaria by 2030. Uh, these two countries, Bhutan and Timor-Leste, have set their goals for eliminating malaria by 2025. And they belong to the E2025 list of WHO. The others have uh, set their goals for zero malaria uh, as the year 2030. But are we really doing enough to reach these goals? Now, the focus has to be on a region free of malaria because individual countries will find it extremely difficult to sustain elimination even if they achieve it, unless their neighbors are free of malaria. I know this very well, sitting in Sri Lanka, where we are working with a huge commitment to prevent the re-establishment of malaria. Because, this is because of the constant importation of malaria from neighboring countries, and also because of the very high prevalence of malaria vectors, which are, in fact, features of all the countries in the region, except currently the Maldives, which uh, don't have uh, malaria vectors prevalent there. Therefore, I applaud the call by WHO today for countries, especially the larger countries with a significant residual burden of malaria, to step up action for a region free of malaria. It couldn't be more timely because if we do not achieve it this time, malaria will be back. And that's the nature of malaria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mendes, for this excellent perspective. Now we will take a five minute break. Uh, the countdown timer on your screen will remind you when we are about to start. So let's break for five minutes and come back to start with session four.
welcome back uh, as you uh, heard before the break the, the progress that was made in the region in the member states towards the elimination of malaria we also had two excellent presentations pre about with the global and the regional perspectives uh, with these perspectives in mind we will now move to the next session where we will hear of best practices that have shown high burden context have had high impact interventions we will hear from the efforts in the greater mekong sub region as well as from high burden settings in india and indonesia to start us off i now invite professor arjun dondop who is a deputy director at mydol oxford tropical medicine research unit at mydol university to speak on the efforts undertaken in the greater mekong sub region over to you professor dondro Uh, we are unable. Uh, I think we do need to unmute, sir. I try to unmute. Yes. Okay. We can thank hear you now. Thank you very yes. much. Thanks for the introduction and giving me the opportunity to highlight some of the components that have uh, contributed to this success in the Great Mekong subregion uh, towards uh, malaria elimination. Um, and some of the countries are not part of zero, so Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, uh, but some are uh, Thailand and uh, Myanmar. Uh, next slide, please. This slide is just to highlight what's prompted now uh, more than 10 years ago for the increased funding and efforts for malaria elimination in the Greater Mekong sub-region which was uh, the emergence and spread of uh, artemisinin drug resistance in falciparum malaria. Previous slide, please. Um, which is partial resistance or intermediate grade resistance. The artemisinin still killed the parasite just at a 10 to 100 fold less effective uh, rate causing slow clearance, but also facilitates partner drug resistance. Uh, with ACT failure, which we have seen uh, increasing in the Great Mekong sub-region. Next slide, please. And then uh, some of these very uh, successful resistant parasite strains have spread throughout uh, the region, different in the Myanmar, uh, Thailand border side compared to, uh, to the other countries. Next slide, please. And then we saw this massive increase in this, this famous uh, Kelch C580Y mutation, a single uh, lineage, very successful, but under drug pressure of DHA paperaquin. Uh, and we see now in uh, Cambodia, but also in Vietnam, after the change of the first line uh, treatment away from DHA paperaquin, that uh, this lineage suddenly is not so successful uh, anymore and taken over by other strains, including uh, artemisinin sensitive strains again. So that is uh, very good news. Next slide, please. So as I said, uh, artemisinin resistant was, was, I think, a very important prompt for, uh, at least in the Great Mekong subregion, to make declarations of aim for malaria elimination uh, with uh, the, the summits in the East Asia uh, and the WHO and country plans for uh, malaria elimination. Also with the realization that getting rid of artemisinin resistant falciparum malaria means eliminating falciparum malaria from the region. Next slide, please. And this went along with uh, a big increase in funding, uh, what we are very grateful for. Uh, and the Global Fund initiated this uh, regional artemisinin resistance initiative. Uh, it's now renamed as RIE because now the focus is more on elimination and no longer only on artemisinin resistance. Um, and that's uh, good that funding has continued to uh, to this date and is the major part of the uh, of the funding for the countries. Next slide, please. So the main components of uh, of the uh, malaria elimination uh, program 
are that it is a very multi-stakeholder uh, effort. Of course, the malaria control programs are very central in that, uh, supported by the WHO, and there's the, the uh, regional office in Phnom Penh for malaria elimination of the WHO, but also the non-government sectors play an important role, private sector, academia, and funders, and they are all together in this regional steering committee uh, governing the, the RAI Global Fund grant. And then pivotal for the success, the main pillar is really this uh, community health-based uh, network of village malaria workers, community health workers, uh, supported by the grant, more than 39,000 uh, workers uh, for uh, surveillance, uh, for uh, vector control measures, but also very much for early testing and treating. Uh, and also over time, uh, the surveillance has massively uh, improved and there's data availability and sharing between countries of these uh, data. Uh, and it's not only for Cipro malaria, uh, Vivex malaria, for which you need uh, radical treatment uh, implementation with, uh, with Primaquine at the moment, is also uh, deployed more and more extensively. And then the, there are the additional activities, uh, the last mile elimination uh, activities uh, consisting of targeted drug administration or, or targeted MDA, different, different terms for that, targeted intervention for forest goers and uh, active case uh, detection in targeted areas. Next slide, please. Next slide is just to show you some, some evidence that those are really uh, very important components. Uh, this is a slide from, uh, from Medical Action Myanmar. Uh, from uh, Myanmar uh, in Mon State, uh, where they showed that uh, setting up a network of village malaria workers, uh, well-functioning, good uh, supply lines, good surveillance, good uh, supervision of the village malaria workers massively reduces uh, falciparum malaria incidents, but also with some delay, uh, Vivex malaria incidents, um, which you can clearly see in these graphs. Uh, next slide, please. On the Myanmar Thai border, there was this uh, intensive uh, malaria elimination efforts led by SMIU uh, together uh, with the other partners. Uh, oh no, this slide is that uh, to maintain the uptake of uh, the health service by village malaria workers when malaria is going down, 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 and a fever patient will no longer have malaria as the main cause of their fever, the package needs to be extended to, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, people still go to their community health worker or village malaria worker. Uh, and that has been uh, trialed again data from, uh, from Myanmar, from Mon State, uh, where they showed when they increased the package, the uptake of services here measured as the monthly blood examination rate increased again. Uh, and that might also be very important for the other countries in the GMS. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows uh, the additional elimination activity uh, for, uh, of targeted mass drug administration or targeted drug administration. Um, in remaining hotspots uh, is a very effective tool to rapidly reduce the malaria burden and the post-treatment malaria prophylactic effect is also very important there. And here you see a uh, current state uh, on the Myanmar Thai board, uh, border where that has uh, contributed a lot in bringing down malaria very rapidly and also getting rid of those uh, nasty artemisinin partly resistant parasites. Uh, and this intervention is now also implemented in uh, Cambodia and will be implemented in uh, Laos. Next slide, please. Uh, then 
malaria is retreating in countries of the GMS uh, in the forest, and there's good evidence for that uh, in observational studies, uh, where, uh, first of all, the, the villagers that still get malaria are no longer uh, children and, and women, but mainly young male adults that go to the, to the forest. Uh, and if you see who gets infected, it really are the people uh, that are uh, residing longer periods of time uh, in the forest. So uh, there is an incentive to specifically target those forest goers, which can be done in different ways. But one way, next slide, please, is to provide uh, chemoprophylaxis to those forest goers. And this is a study that uh, our unit uh, did, uh, not with an ideal drug to do that, uh, artemithalumifantrin. Uh, Lumfentrin has only short uh, plasma half-life, so the protective effect is not very long-lived. Uh, but because of the resistant problems, there was at that time uh, not a lot of other choice. But the intervention was highly successful in uh, reducing uh, the uh, prevalence of malaria in these uh, forest goers, as you can see in uh, on. Uh, the graph uh, there. Uh, by the way, this was mainly uh, Vivex malaria uh, in addition to Falciparum malaria. Next slide, please. Can you, yes. And this is uh, showing, first of all, it's showing the, the massively improved surveillance over the years with uh, very detailed by districts. Uh, incident uh, rates or APIs, uh, this of falciparum malaria, and you see over the last uh, nine, eight, nine years, uh, a massive decline in uh, falciparum malaria. Myanmar is clearly a concern at the moment uh, with the health system uh, not in good shape uh, because of the political situation. Uh, also, the reporting is, uh, is very incomplete at the moment, uh, so uh, we really have to make sure that there, uh, the community-based serv malaria service uh, are maintained. Next slide, please. Uh, and it's not only uh, for Cipro malaria, but also Vivex malaria going down, uh, where, as I said, the further uh, de deployment, wider deployment of eight aminoquinolines for radical treatment will be very important. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, malaria elimination is uh, progressing very well, especially in the Eastern Greater Mekong uh, subregion. Uh, I highlighted uh, some of, uh, of the main components, uh, but by far the most pivotal uh, cornerstone of the success is this, this well-supervised network of uh, community health workers, uh, both for surveillance, both for the effective control measures and the early diagnosis and treatment. And 5X malaria is more difficult to eliminate, uh, and uh, falciparum malaria is ahead. Uh, but overall, uh, progress has gone very well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Dondrop. Now we will hear from Dr. Subhasisha Mohanty, State Program Officer of NVDCP from Odisha, please. Over to you, Dr. Mohanty, please. Uh. Are you there, Dr. Mohanty, please? You could start. We could, uh, unmute yourself and you could start, please. Uh, 
we are unable to. Yes, you could start, sir, please. Uh, we are not able to hear you. You need to unmute. I have, I'm already on. Yes. Now, now we can hear you now. Thank you. Please proceed. Yeah. Uh, again, again, I think we have lost you. You're lost your voice. I think you, we, I think we will be able to hear you now. If you, if you remove the headphones, I think you can, it's coming after. When you remove the headphones, we could hear the sound. Thank you. Can you try again? Oh, sir. Uh, yes. Am I audible, yes. sir? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Good. Yes. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm Dr. Subhasis Manti, uh, Joint Director, uh, Vector One Disease and BBDCB State of Odisha. Uh, first of all, I must uh, thank the organizers for allowing me, allowing me to uh, present the state-specific initiative that is taken for malaria control, uh, Daman. Uh, on behalf of uh, my director, I'm here to present. And uh, Daman, as we all know, in the year uh, 2016, we do have around uh, 4,44,000 malaria cases in the state. It, is, it was one of the highest case load in the decade. And uh, to address the issue, it was a big challenge at that point of time. So when in 2017, with the support of government of India, we received around 1.13 crore LLN. And uh, at the same time, a state-specific program for malaria control, that is Durga Manchalare Malaria Nirakarana Vision, Malaria Nirakarana, that was started. And uh, in the year 2017, we saw a decline of malaria cases and up to 2021, uh, what we saw is around 94.26% decline in malaria cases in comparison to 2016. So we all know that in national strategic plan, we do have high burden, high impact uh, concept is there. But uh, during that period, uh, visualizing that some specific intervention has to be done in the state to reduce the malaria load, a high burden, high impact concept was incorporated in hard to reach area in the shape of uh, Daman, the Daman concept was conceptualized. And it was an intensive malaria control drive in ex inaccessible areas of high malaria, high burden blocks of most of the uh, districts, around 24 districts. So if you think of Odisha, the, uh, it is an, if you go back to uh, histor historical, please, please go back, sir. First, first slide, please. Uh, if you think of Odish, uh, next, next slide. As you all know, at a glance, if you will see, Odisha covers one of the eastern state of India, covers only 4.7% 4 of the India's land area, and 34% of area is forestry. And in over 47,000 villages, there are 47 million population that covers 3% of the total uh, India's border, uh, India's uh, population. And uh, malaria is year-old major public health problem of the state before 2017. And in 2016, Odisha contributed around 40% of malaria burden to India's border. Proportion of PF cases is being very high. It is around more than 90%. And other challenges are there, like uh, rapid urbanization, mining, industrial activities with migration, high rate of migration, and uh, rapid increase in potential uh, mosquito breeding sites. Next. And if you go back to historical trend of malaria in Odisha, and it has declined steadily between 4 to 2004 to 2013, with a major decline from 2006 to 2010. We can see the uh, diagram also. But again, there was a rise after 2013 till mid of uh, 2017 in 2012 
bivalent RDK was uh, introduced and surveillance was increased. So uh, though little bit of LLN was distributed, the uh, uh, surveillance, age, uh, surveillance was high, the impact of LLN was not that much because it was a short period and uh, uh, limited to some small lag, some lags only. And malaria surveillance remained consistent, but with different tools. So we reported around 460 deaths in 2002, when only microscopy was the diagnostic method. And from 2003 to 2010, reported deaths were 187 to 332. And uh, till 2007, microscopy was the main tool. And in 2009, we got uh, RDK, monovalent, and 2012, uh, bivalent RDK were introduced. So, and, so after that, we saw surveillance increase and gradually with EDCT decline in malaria was observed. Next. So Odisha, 23 districts out of 30 districts were high endemic in 2016. And we can see the map of 2016 and 2021. There's a lot of change. The red carpet that is being shown is uh, of uh, forest, forest fringe area, hilly terrains, and uh, due to different ge geoecological condition, it is difficult to control malaria. In 2016, the green zone, what we see is coastal belt mostly, and uh, mostly they are low endemic areas for long. And now it uh, only Malkangiri, one district is having more than five API. At that point of time, the API range from 10.9 to 17.13. But in 2021, the API came down to 0 0.56 with total case load of 25,503 from uh, 4,44,000. And uh, significantly, death also reduced 83% reduction of death was there. And significant case decline is continuing in 2022 also. Next slide. So uh, regarding Daman, it is a flagship program of Odisha government. It was envisaged in 2016 and initially for it was planned for eight southern districts like Malkangiri, Koraput, Kalandi, Kondamal, Gajapati and all. But later it was planned for the entire state. Now uh, we extend, expanded it to 24 districts. Then in the next five year plan, we have given proposal for 30 districts. So in those eight districts, around 20% population of the state live there. And they, at that point of time, contributed more than 55% of malaria cases and 50% of malaria deaths due to, to the state's burden. And IMR, MMR, MMR and under five children mortality was in those pockets were very high. And major threat was the asymptomatic that is called febrile, probably 10 to 80% asymptomatic cases are there. And it is a known fact that malaria infection leads to uh, mortality. And Daman addresses malaria, malnutrition, and anemia in uh, those areas. Objective being that uh, reducing malaria parasite load in the community residing in inaccessible villages and hamlets. And diagnosis of both symptomatic as well as asymptomatic, asymptomatic malaria as I, we all were listening to earlier presentation regarding asymptomatic malaria as a challenge cases through mass screening and ensuring complete treatment of all malaria positive cases with appropriate anti-malarials as per national drug policy. Along with mass screening assessment of nutritional and hemoglobin status was also a part of that uh, camp. And the activities conducted in a camp approach, special focus with, uh, to the most vulnerable groups like under five children, pregnant women and lactating mother and uh, overall improvement in the access to diagnosis, treatment, and prevention and control of malaria in inaccessible villages and hamlets. One slide, please. Also, now we understand, understanding the Daman. Daman does not mean only mass screening. It is a basket of various strategy or activity that is under one umbrella that we have, the concept is like that and a mass screening with EDCT, early diagnosis and complete treatment at the same point, and appropriate vector control measure, LLN use of scaling, if LLN not available, whether ITN is there, and 
places where IRS has to be taken as a secondary vector control measure. And supporting interventions like ICs and BCC, community mobilization and monitoring and supervision, ICC, BCC and ICBCC and community mobilization, not only in Doman villages, hard to reach area, but also in nearby area. And uh, what are the impending factors in accessing the services in inaccessible? Not only inaccessibility is a criteria that distance, topography, road condition, but unavailability of skilled healthcare providers is an issue there. And uh, delayed care seeking and lack of threat perception in that community because most of them are tribal belt and forest areas. So uh, delayed uh, lack of uh, threat perception is an important uh, issue in those areas. There are inherent constraints for which public health services do not reach adequately and disease surveillance was weak at that point of time. So strategy that has been, please go back. Previous we can see. So now we can see what are the why strategy we have adopted. Suppose in a sub-center 12 villages are there. Not all villages are inaccessible. So out of 12, only five villages are inaccessible. So we focused on those five villages to take the Daman approach in those villages. So uh, as a part of strategy, initially three rounds of Daman camps were planned. First round in the month of April, May, where mass screening, mass malaria screening, plus health checkup of less than five year children, plus pregnant and lactating mothers were done. And with, at that point of time, first round, IRS was also done followed by checking that whether LLN be used or not and upscaling LLN use and with intensification of routine, other routine programs. In second round, it is done in September and October uh, where mass malaria screening plus health checkup plus uh, all supportive activities like training, IC activity, monitoring and evaluation, operational research, establishment of non-SIFTT, child and maternal health checkup, IRS was conducted. In the third round health camp from January to February, malaria screening of selected population plus health checkup of less than five children plus pregnant and lactating women having less than six month child. So uh, it was divided me, into the two components for implementation. Excuse me, Dr. Monty, excuse me, yes. Dr. Monty uh, because uh, we are running late in time and there are many international speakers who will have to leave later on. I yes, would sir. request if you could complete it in the next two to three minutes. Yes, yes, your presentation. Thank yes, you. Sir. We have divided the components of implementation into two uh, phases and planning phase and implementation phase. And in planning phase, the identification of block, inaccessible village, volunteers, and implementation phase, we are preparing the list of blocks and uh, how we'll move ahead with mass malaria screening and vector control activities that has to be taken up in this type of phase. So, so requirement for successful Daman program is most important is we should be able to uh, screen at least 90% of the population residing in that area. Along with uh, LLN or ITN or IRS as vector control measure and 100% drug compliance with, in the form of EDCT has to be ensured and uh, follow up and timely intervention follow up by Daman volunteers, Asaj, Anganwadi workers in those areas after a Daman camp is highly essential. So for that household wise line listing of population is essential. So in this approach, in three camps, we may see in hard to reach area with mass screening of all our intervention, the number of um, positive cases is declining. It is giving not only effect to hard to reach area, but possible area, those who are nearer to that hard to reach area also, the number of cases due to the parasite clearance and uh, vector uh, clearance. But the effect is not only in hard to area, but also in accessible pockets also. So what we have seen, the statistics of epidemiological situation of Daman in Odisha is showing that in five years, we have majority uh, around 87% decline we have seen in malaria cases. Overall, 94.26%, but in the Daman villages, 78 to 87% decline. We have observed only 10,000 cases in two th and around 80% are asymptomatic. These are uh, glimpses of uh, 
melee uh, that uh, camp activity that is being taken in uh, taken up in those areas and one of the uh, slides you can see one of the photograph district collector motivating the drive and it is a village level intersectoral collaboration activity above all and uh, vision forward is that uh, first is restrategization of daman activity we have to uh, because five years already implement implemented we have seen many changes three times we have uh, changed the guideline now we have to restrategize the daman activity basing upon the reports of research organization and expanding to other areas where malaria case load is still high, may not be hard to reach pockets because now most uh, most will be motorable innovation in communication materials in local language use of pro pico projector for visual impact incorporation of evidence based activity by conducting entomological surveillance in daman areas ensuring surveillance in pre monsoon monsoon and post monsoon phase strengthening supply chain management in has to area reach area research on vector behavior in daman areas and last but not the least thank you for uh, listening uh, my presentation carefully thank you uh, thank you very much dr monthi now we will hear from dr praveen bharti the scientist at the icmr national institute of malaria research over to you dr bharti please thank you sir can i have my presentation yes sir just give us a few seconds yeah. <clears throat> so meanwhile a very good afternoon and very good morning very good evening to organizers for providing an opportunity to speak this important project and uh, this uh, this is the malaria elimination demonstration project with the public private partnership with the government of madhya pradesh icmr and sun pharma created one foundation known as foundation for disease elimination and control fdc so all these three parties have their roles and responsibility basically government of madhya pradesh is responsible for supplies of all commodities such as diagnostic anti malarials llin irs whereas icmr play and role in technical and uh, research guideline supports and fdec is mainly responsible for the operational management the project was started in conception since 2015 but on paper it comes on the occasion of 25th april world malaria day on 2016 and sun pharma has signed omu mou with icmr in presence of honorable Uh, health union health minister of the state uh, of the uh, country that is sri jp nadda ji and then subsequently sun pharma has established the foundation for disease elimination and control which is mainly responsible for the malaria disease elimination and then subsequently in the november uh, icmr to nirth and government of madhya pradesh and uh, fdc science type of type type party agreement for the implementation and then with, with this the goal is to eliminate malaria between 3 to 4 year of uh, uh, time period as a district as a unit operation and also to the reintroduction of malaria from outside district and prevent resulting to prevent the outbreak the basic technical methodology used in this project is t4 strategy after treatment track is also necessary to cut down the reservoir for the further transmission and along with icc gcc but and to advance tour plan for all the staff however i am going to mention here that operational methodology is very much important and uh, as a we know that the daily unannounced supervisory visit from uh, all the supervisors to the field worker and malaria technical coordinators are done and it is worth to mention that the weekly progress was reviewed by our project director it doesn't matter that where is project director i am uh, taking his name dr altaf lal serves as a project director here and despite of his busy schedule he has to Every week, 
uh, review meeting and the only yesterday we have taken 244 week meetings so during this uh, uh, period if you see that the graph we have tested around 0.33 million the uh, ticket 650 malaria positive cases with anti malarials and if you see that the graph on the upper side initially when the field operation was started that time the prevalence was very high but subsequently in the after first year and second year it is what drop down and if you see that third year there is july august there is a small peak this peak is due to the imported malaria case not an indigenous malaria case may I have next slide please yeah so these are the imported case are basically from coming from different state or different district of madhya pradesh and majority of the cases were came from the telangana state because all the people who are laborer went to the uh, bamboo cutting over there and coming back then they have a, uh, we have a stream over there and they found turn out positive for malaria so imported malaria is equally important to monitor in case of malaria elimination at the era of malaria elimination may i have next please so another another uh, aspect of the project is the capacity building as uh, we uh, have mentioned that uh, we have recruited 235 malaria workers and 25 supervisors who supervise the workers and uh, we have provided 3 days intensive training on diagnosis treatment prevention as well as most important things is ethics of the research and ethics of the implementation and then subsequently we took the uh, post test analysis and people who has qualified more than 70% threshold marks we have recruited only them and rest we have uh, not recruited them and again we do this based on this so these are the uh, human resources which is work for mdp that is an asset for not this project but after that they can be used for any other program for the malaria tb or hiv anything may i have next please <coughs> so so how we are achieve this uh, uh, elimination program with the help of uh, t4 strategy but at the same time uh, real time data analysis is equally important which play an instrumental to achieve the significant reduction and if you see that the right hand side the graph the slide is might be busy but the quality of this mobile application is online available anyone can who is having id that can any time check the real time malaria burden in the country and also analyze the data based on the just clicking the tab so 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 if you see that the figure of the uh, left hand of this one that uh, actual number of fever case in the month or in the day or in the year or the actual number of uh, positive cases and also it help in the supply chain management if if the supply chain management is a composed sort of field worker or a malaria field coordinator is having shortage of act or a diagnostic then immediately we can assess from this her district headquarter and send to them directly may i have the next please so based on this result if you see that the this uh, uh, slide is uh, showing that how the chocolate color of this uh, sub centers were clean out in there if you see that the, in 2017 there was eight different hot spot which is having high burden malaria area and subsequently in 2017 it was only three in 2018 only two and 2019 20 onwards it becomes zero and based on all these activities we propose a model for malaria elimination that model is basically in built to the uh, uh, hr diagnostic case management vector control and this model was developed based on the learning on particularly operational management monitoring and feedback entomological investigation and vector control along with the icbcc and capacity building so 
May I have the next uh, previous one, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so, so based on that, uh, we develop a model, and model can be uh, already published. Uh, we can assess all the this one. And uh, in summary, that we have summarized that uh, uh, there is a need for an elimination model derived from real time field experience towards the malaria elimination. And the model should keep AM or MPW as a frontline workers and entire staff from district level DMO to up. All should adhere the strict tour advanced plan or advanced duty plan and accordingly that the program can monitor these are their uh, activities also with the adequate resource from state level local level as well as uh, block level and besides all these things training are must be incorporated in the plan and digital data reporting is one of the most important pillar for the developing a model for malaria elimination along with IECGCC and the uh, mass screening also need to plan that high API are hard to reach as my previous speaker Dr. Mohanty has already mentioned that how mass screening has impacted to the uh, malaria control and elimination leading to elimination in Odisha. Therefore, uh, based on the API and hard to reach area, we need to have a plan for the mass screening and treatment also and digital supply chain management regular periodic review from point to point review from not only the district level, then state level, then national level and external as well. And the ownership of the program is required from up to ground level. The last but not the least is the elimination point is basically main focused on operational management and financial control. Thank you so much. We Thank have already, much, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Bharti, for your presentation. Now we move forward and we'd like to hear from Professor Chandra Yoga Aditama. He's the director and of the postgraduate school, Yarsi University, Jakarta, and professor of faculty of medicine at the University of Indonesia, and a former colleague at WHO Sierra. He will speak to, on the sub elimination, sub national elimination efforts undertaken in Indonesia. Over to you, Dr. Aditama, please. Thank you, Chair. So thank you for the opportunity to, to, to join this meeting. Always happy to be back in, in stereo, even though virtually. So my topic in the first slide is not shown is is about sub -mal subnational malaria elimination. Next slide, please. Oh, so, that, oh, anyway, so there's no title. Anyway, subnational malaria elim elimination. No, 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 no. Keep that. Please keep the slide. Okay. So for talking about subnational mal malaria elimination, I I, I put this map. This is the map of Indonesia on top of the Indonesian flag. But there are three reasons. I mean, there are three uh, reasons that, that subnational malaria elimination is really good for Indonesia uh, for at least three reasons. As I said, this is Indonesian map I put on top of Indonesian flag. But if, if I put the Indonesian map on top of US map in the same scale, so on the left side is the west, west coast of US, and on the, on the left side, on, on the right side is the east coast of US. So Indonesia is spreading from west coast to east coast of, of US. It is spreading from London to Vladivostok. So the area is quite wide. So that's why the first reason why subnational malaria elimination is needed. Second important uh, uh, information from this slide, you can see that Indonesia has 17,504 islands. Uh, so that is another reason why we need subnational mal malaria elimination for, the, for, for each of the group of islands at least. And the third reason, you can see the number of population is 271 million. So it's quite big. Of course, it's not as big as India, but I think it's the second biggest in, in, in Seattle. This is the National Malaria Action Plan 2020 and 2024. As you can see, the goal is by 2024, eliminate at least... 75% of district in Indonesia. In the previous slide, it was mentioned the number of district is 500 something. So at least 75 of district in Indonesia achieve malaria elimination status or no high endemic district by 2024. That is the goal. And there are three objectives. The first one is to reduce the burden of API from baseline 61 
to 14 by the end of 2024 and to interrupt indigenous malaria transmission from baseline 168 on 2018 to 95 in 2024 and then to prevent reintroduction of malaria. So those are the goals and the objective on the uh, action plan until 2024. Since we all know that our target is until 2030, so these are the milestones, uh, Indonesian milestone to achieve the target of 2030. On 2019, certain districts should be free of malaria. We can see the result uh, later on. 2025 will be the last year of indigenous cases in all districts. 2028, all districts reach the malaria elimination status. 2029, all provinces reach the malaria elimination. And 2030, Indonesia will be certified as malaria elimination country. So as I mentioned, there are so many islands. No, no, no. Please skip the slide, please. We have so many islands, then we, we group the island into five groups. The first group, the, the one below, is the Java Bali, Bali region, uh, and it is illuminated already in 2023. The second group, the maybe violet color, is the Sumatra and Sulawesi, and it will be illuminated in 2025. The light green region, uh, it is the two regions, the Kalimantan and North Maluku, will be 2027. And the Maluku region, the blue one, will be on 2028. And the last, surely, will be the 2029, the Papua, I mean, the yellow one, and the brown one region. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So these are the achievements so, so far until 2021. It was mentioned in the previous slide, the target on 2020 was 300 districts free of malaria. So in, in the 2021, is already... 347 district malaria free out of 500 something district. Uh, remaining district 127 still in low endemic, 16 moderate endemic, 24 is still high endemic. And during this high uh, World Malaria Day commemoration this year, there will be 33 uh, district will receive malaria free certificate. So you can see the white one. Can you please keep the slide? I'm still four minutes. Uh, the white one is the, the one with certified ma malaria free, and the red one, mostly in Papua and some part of, of that one below, East Nusa Tenggara, is the high, high endemic uh, uh, area. Next slide, please. This is the process of sub elimination in, uh, uh, in Indonesia. As already mentioned, it, become, it, it began with the district sub elimination, and after that, the provincial sub elimination. For the district sub elimination, the requirement, the positivity rate should be below 5%. Of course, the annual parasitical index should be less than one per 1,000 population. And there will be no indigenous cases for at least three consecutive years. And it should pass the criteria of malaria elimination, malaria elimination assessment tool that was prepared by Minister of Health of Indonesia. Uh, so that is for district uh, elimination. I already mentioned achievement of 347 of, out of 514 this they already achieved elimination status. For provincial elimination, the requirement are all districts should be certified already by MOH and it should pass the criteria of malaria elimination. Out of 34 uh, provinces, four, four provinces already meet the main criteria. And now these four provinces, all are, are, are in the island of Java, the most populated island. Uh, all of these provinces are now under process assessment for provincial elimination. Next slide, please. So on the left, you can see uh, the process. Uh, so in the national level down, there is a national committee who will assess whether uh, district or province are already uh, reached the elimination status or not. But the, the national committee is not only assess the situation, but they also support directly district and province in their elimination process. Of course, before COVID, the, the support should be by, by going to the district or province, but now the support can be by virtual as well. On the right-hand side, you can see the process, I mean, the, the, some kind of criteria, it is already mentioned in the previous slide. So the yellow one for district should be no indigenous cases in the last three years, and then readiness for, for prevention of reintroduction. If it is already achieved, then uh, the, 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 the green one, major objective will receive malaria elimination certificate from ministry. This down below the, in the middle, so if 
two years all districts in one province already certified, then the national committee will assess whether the province that province will, will receive the uh, elimination marriage certificate or not. And one below, the province received elimination certificate from the central government. Next slide, please. So these are some policies uh, in general. I will just mention this decentralization because Indonesia health sector are, are fully decentralized. And the, below the green one mentioned that the regulation could not own national level, but also local uh, government and local commitment are of course very much needed. And the, the one below is the importance of multi-sectoral collaboration in all levels, national level, provincial level, and district level. As well as, as, well as empowered community, diagnostics, treatment, integrated sector management, and public-private partnership. Next slide, please. We'll have the next, yeah, okay. So these are the four strategies, specific strategies for malaria, malaria immunization in Indonesia. So the red one is acceleration. The objective is to reduce the number of malaria cases. This is for all high endemic area with, with API more, more than five per 1,000. And then after that is intensification. The objective is to clear focus area. The target is the moderate limit. And one is interrupt loss mission. Uh, okay. To the area. Objective to prevent reintroduction. The next slide. Sorry, organizer, am I audible? Now we lost you for five seconds, but you are now audible, yes. I think you should, you could switch off your video. Maybe that will help. We are unable to hear you at this moment. Can you speak? Okay, so we have lost the audio. Can I continue? Just two or three more slides? Yes, yes please. Yeah, okay, so, so these are the challenges because Dr. Faleta just called me. I saw it from here and I saw it in my phone. Okay, these are, these are the, uh, the six challenges that, that we face in Indonesia. Number one, malaria is not included in the minimum surface of standard. Why this minimum surface of standard is, is important? Because I mentioned, uh, earlier that health is already de decentralized. So has uh, all of the health uh, program should be in the minimum surface standard. I mean, all of the priority, but malaria is not there yet. So that's the first uh, challenges. Second, uh, we all know that high incidence cases in Papua of Indonesia. The third one is the hard to reach population in remote area, uh, such as illegal minor, etc. Next slide. The fourth challenge is still high dependence on donor. We need a, a more uh, government commitment in this regard. And the fifth one is implementation of diagnostic services and quality assurance and treatment need to be improved. And the last one is the real need of uh, cross-program and multi-sectoral collaboration. Next slide. So we already know uh, that Papua is one of the important uh, problem for malaria in Indonesia. 80% of malaria cases is from Papua and 45% of malaria death cases also from Papua. So there are several specific strategy intervention. Number one, strong commitment is already there. Oh, not yet. Number two is early diagnostic and prompt treatment. Number three is community involvement. And the, the last bullet I, I, I put it here is about vaccine. So uh, we do hope that, uh, I think the minister already sent an official letter. If Can I get the previous slide, please? Uh, if, if, if Papua could be one of the pilot of the vaccine uh, study that, that now uh, implementing globally, it will be good for, for the vaccine st study, then it will, it will be good for Papua as well. Next slide now. That is thank you. And that is terima kasih in Indonesian language. Thank you and sorry for the interruption, technological glitch.
thank you very much, Professor Aditama. Thank you. So we have had this rich, uh, rich presentations uh, in the last two sessions that were scanning the perspective from the global and also the regional perspective, as well as we were uh, enlightened with the success uh, cases from the region. As we move forward in our program, in the next session, we have two moderated panel discussions. We have two distinguished panel moderators, Dr. Swarup Sarkar and Professor Pratap Singa, Singa Sivadan. They will lead us into deeper exploration of elimination approaches at the subnational level, as well as preventing the re-emergence of disease due to cross-border transmissions. Our takeaway from these two sessions is to see how some best practices have yielded results in malaria elimination and prevention, and how they can be replicated in high burden settings for high impact. So now we move forward, and it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the first discussion, which focuses on sub-national elimination, Dr. Surup Sarkar, who is a former colleague at WHO Sierra and collaborator in disease elimination strategies for many of us. He will lead the discussion with participants from the rollback area and country representatives from Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, and Thailand. Over to you, Dr. Sarkar, please. Thank you, Suman, and thank you, everybody, uh, for, uh, for hold, holding this meeting in a historical time, because uh, we are all aware of uh, our global promise to eliminate, and particularly for malaria, you know, it will be near eradication, you know, by 2030. So unless we have five years of extensive elimination and 2028, unless we are ready for validation, would miss the goal. And it will be a pity because malaria out of all SDG 3.3 diseases is the first one which was up for not only elimination and eradication. And it's not good to see that, you know, it's still wavering and at its current rate, you would fail to reach the 2030 goal unless we act now. And the importance of the CRO in the whole thing, if you look at the Global Malaria Effort Program, you would see that CRO is the most advanced uh, region where it can produce maximum number of countries in its milestone of malaria elimination on time. However, we can draw and redraw the map and the best practice which started from subnational elimination in Indonesia would be again redrawn and drawn new time charts because unless we provide, localize the burden and provide enough resources and you know uh, measure the local outcome in the local area, we'll never be able to meet, meet this goal in time. You have seen, I'll just take one example, Indonesia, Bhutan have been very close to malaria elimination in Bhutan but again failing and failing because in bordering districts, few districts were unable to mobilize enough resources and uh, you know, uh, necessary uh, support. Having said this, the subnational elimination framework is not yet additional tool, it's just a game-changing tool. This will help the countries which are serious for elimination to localize resources and ensure resources in that local area Otherwise, the elimination would remain a uh, non-stop, you know, uh, moving goaling, uh, goalpost and enigma. Having said this, uh, we have a very rich panel today, uh, five speakers we have, but I must say that, you know, every speaker must be sticking to maximum four minutes, and I'll encourage the WHO uh, organizer to alert the speaker uh, on four minutes to have one more minute only. And I'll request each speaker to focus how the subnational elimination framework as a strategy or as a game-changing tool can help each country from their experience to eliminate malaria and keeping the global promise in time. Over to the panelists, I have, uh, I have the privilege to invite uh, Dr. Corin uh, <clears throat> Karima, who is the current CEO of the Rollback Malaria, to uh, start with her uh, presentation. Uh, Corinne, please. Yeah, th th thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, okay. 
Thank you very much. So uh, as we, we, we have seen uh, through the initiative, for instance, of the GMS and experience of many other countries uh, of accelerated reduction of malaria subnationally, we have seen progress. And uh, I, I take again this opportunity to, to really congratulate uh, Southeast Asia's countries. But we are seeing that, uh, there, are, there, 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 there are many areas uh, that are not ready for subnational uh, verification. So the use of high quality local data is really essential in the process and for the overall fight against uh, malaria. As you have said, this will first of all ensure that we are targeting uh, our resources very well and then the response uh, has also greater uh, impact. So, this approach will uh, not only uh, get us away from the one size fits all approach. So the use of uh, data to drive action uh, will also be complemented with the flexibility as well as uh, given the guidance of uh, WHO to provide uh, countries not only to adapt uh, all the the, the 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 use of the the, the existing tool, but it all, will also uh, help countries to innovate. So, for instance, if I take the example of um, uh, Odisha in India, so they've used the digital platform in the micro planning of ITN distribution, and this is really an example that demonstrates that the project in Mandla. Uh, with the use of digital solution and locally driven uh, multi-sectorial approach to malaria elimination has shown greater uh, impact. And you have seen, for instance, they had an impressive uh, reduction of 91% of indigenous uh, malaria cases in the Mandla uh, district. So those approaches uh, are, are teaching us that innovative approach and how, for instance, to better use, uh, I can say, entomological data to adapt, for instance, the, the implementation of uh, indoor residual spraying. So the other one also, uh, it's really important that uh, the use of data is also helping countries to track progress as well as to use, uh, to adapt all the new uh, technology. And uh, the reinforcement of health system uh, through malaria elimination initiative, it's really critical. So the use of data for malaria, it's also improving the, the, the surveillance uh, system. And then it's also helping uh, our countries to respond to other emerging uh, disease. So you see that for instance, in the Mandla uh, uh, example, the program was able to support other services uh, including, for instance, the polio vaccination, the dengue management, as well as the COVID surveillance to, 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 to strengthen the, the, the health system. So it's really important that subnational political actors are, are dealing closely with the health and then the development issues. And then uh, they, this also is helping uh, communities to know the population as well as uh, the needs. So, as we move uh, into 2023, uh, so we, the RBM uh, Partnership to Hand Malaria, we are committed to work with regional partners so that uh, they, they, they can meet the ambitious target. As you see, they want to have uh, zero cases by 2030. So thank you very much. Dr. Soro, please unmute. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, thank you, Corinne, you know, for being very specific and making a point that the data has been our, you know, <clears throat> lighthouse for uh, um, making action specific. However, data has not always lead to resource allocation in right places. Having said this, I want to Dr. Tonu uh, from uh, National Center for Victorborne Disease Control in India to make a case for subnational elimination and how it relates to Indian stellar progress and to address its challenges. Tanu, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Excellencies, Regional Director, Dr. Poonam Ketrapal Singh, distinguished partners and global experts. Uh, it is my honor to represent my country today and I thank WHO CRO for organizing this high level commemorative seminar on malaria, high burden to high impact. Uh, as we all know, in the morning session, Honorable HFM, in his opening address, has already informed that India has made a remarkable progress since the turn of the country, uh, century 
in reducing the malaria incidence in almost all its states. I urge you all to view this progress in the context of the size and the diversity of India, as well as its share of the global burden of malaria cases. The scale up of services delivered through public sector has improved the standard of care. And this standard of care has been improved across the country through various health and family uh, health and wellness centers. And subsequently, there has been a reduction of 79% of malaria deaths between 2015 to 2021. Overall, India reported a reduction of 86% confirmed malaria cases in the same period of time. The country definitely recognizes the need of sub-national approaches and strategies to address areas having zero or very low endemicity to highly endemic remote rural and tribal areas. India has also set the goal of malaria elimination by 2030 in response to WHO's global technical strategy and following the NFME, the national strategic plan was made from 17 to 22, where the states and districts were already categorized as per the API and it was envisaged to achieve elimination in a phased manner. The malaria elimination strategy is the same as it is all across the world, integrated vector management, long-lasting insecticidal nets, case-based surveillance, and rapid response in low endemic areas, epidemic preparedness and response, behavior change communication, and community mobilization. Uh, by following this strategy, presently, out of 36 states and UTs, 34 states and union territories, have achieved the annual parasite incidence of less than one. A total of 125 districts have reported zero indigenous, indigenous cases till December, this is provisional. And the number of uh, districts with annual parasite incidence of one and above has shrinked to 24 districts in 2021 as compared to 154 districts in 2015. In, in 2021, 125 districts reported zero indigenous cases. This uh, also shows that there is already, already an effort towards subnational malaria elimination. Now, uh, if, if we see our uh, COVID pandemic, India undertook necessary actions not to let the malaria research during this period, as has been very aptly said by one of the experts that malaria has a history of coming back. So uh, there are you know, continued efforts from the government of India and the government of India has now also instituted the awards to districts, states for achieving zero indigenous case status and maintaining it for three consecutive years. This is on attaining sub-national malaria elimination and for promoting healthy competition among the district and states during this World Malaria uh, Day on 25th of April, our Honorable HFM and our Honorable Minister of State, they uh, gave, gave awards to 17 states for doing excellent work towards their movement on malaria elimination. Now, uh, the country is already developing a sub-national guidelines for validation of malaria elimination. So as we move forward, we will be uh, having, uh, we will have to have a lot of high quality data at local level. This has been suggested. And as you can see that in our country, some of the districts, some of the states have, doing, have been doing exceedingly well. We can take the example of Mandla, Odisha. We can take the example of Mizoram and Tripura. Uh, during the COVID time, uh, there was no uh, uh, you know, uh, shortage of LLINs. LLINs was distributed in time. Similarly, in Chhattisgarh, in the, bus in the district of Bastar, which is highly pandemic for malaria, the Bastar malaria movement was started. So we are, not trying to, we are now trying to actually have uh, state-wise, district-wise, and sub-district-wise plans in place for which uh, India has undertaken extensive review of malaria status in the states through support from WHO. And the 2017 to 22 malaria strategic plan has been reviewed. Six states have been reviewed by visiting uh, thoroughly across the country. Three states, uh, the desk reviews have been done. And these reports are very encouraging. And uh, we will be uh, now formulating our national strategic plan from 23 to 27, which is really going to be a very important plan for us. And this will focus all its strategy on subnational malaria elimination as well. However, there are challenges on the way, and challenges are that we uh, are struggling to have data from the private sector. As you know, India is a big country, and the private sector also caters to a large amount of malaria patients. But uh, we are working on it, and very soon we will be having the data from the private sector through IHIP, again supported by uh, WHO, and various other partners are also supporting us in this endeavor. 
then we are trying to integrate the health and wellness centers that have come up during this uh, government's re uh, regimen. And these Tanu, uh, Tanu, brief, uh, Tanu, brief, please. I'm, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. So urban health mission also we are trying to integrate an intersectoral approach. In the, th in the end, I just thank uh, WHO CRO for focusing on India and we reiterate our commitment to achieving malaria elimination by 2030. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tanu, and thank you, uh, India as a member state, for you know for uh, holding uh, such a stellar program. And if India can eliminate the whole regional burden, it would be shrunk to uh, a very very low level. All of us know this. And please keep your good work up. Now I have the pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Musiko Rahman, who is a uh, who is a national malaria <coughs> control program epidemiologist. Dr. Musiko, please and please highlight. You know how are you finding? your uh, particular, uh, you know, uh, three districts in Chittagong, you know, and the use of subnational elimination and application of that. Uh, over to Dr. Musigur, please. Thank you, honorable uh, moderator, respected, distinguished. Uh, if I am audible, yes, is it okay, please. sir? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So uh, Bangladesh uh, National Malaria Elimination is uh, passing a great uh, paradigm with alluring cakes, because we have 13 in a living district, almost uh, almost 10 districts have been ready for subnational elimination. But the key impediments of our um, subnational elimination or um, uh, elimination target is our three hill district. That is uh, Bandurban, Rangamati, Khagraturi. And you will be surprised that uh, 93% uh, patient burden is from this hill area. And uh, uh, all, um, among the three hill districts, Bandurban contributes around 72% um, of the total, uh, 93%. So the key impediment were, um, to, to, uh, to ab avoid the intimate, uh, this impediment, we have we WHO from uh, technical assistance from WHO, field support from BRAC and uh, other stakeholders, we have already mapped uh, this uh, hill uh, area and we have uh, village-wise map uh, considering the uh, quantitative information uh, of, of malaria-related um, social risk factor. And almost um, we are um, 80, um, 800, 35 is from Bandarbon itself. So after mapping, we are now in the phase of um, community consultation where we will uh, triangulate with con uh, qualitative information and there would be a plenary after this exercise and uh, we will go for micro planning and um, micro planning. So this is our approach actually to avoid this impediment. Along with this, you know, this three hill district is with border of Mizoram and also uh, Urul, uh, also Tripura, some parts. We also try to <coughs> establish collaboration, uh, cross-border collaboration with India counterpart, district to district uh, collaboration. And also uh, we are working with our uh, border guard, border guard force, because there are some hard to reach area, area where without, without um, armed forces support, we can't go. And also we <clears throat> we try uh, to address the Zoom chassis, Zoom farmer, and forest guards to some extent uh, extend by treatment. We will we will pick up them and we will formalize them with uh, this hill district um, king uh, king uh, related administration like Karbari headman. We will involve them and <clears throat> we will um, build their capacity to. Mm, uh, to provide, uh, to do RDT and uh, also the um, uncomplicated malaria treatment. So this is our status and also <clears throat> uh, we, are, uh, we are in line with our target and there are 51 elimination, 51 non-endemic district will, from support from WHO, will go for um, uh, endemicity assessment uh, with, with, um, with the gross scientific evidence and then we will declare, first we declare 51 district, subnational elimination, then 10 district, and then uh, this uh, three hill district. So thank you for hearing. This is in short from me.
And thank you. Question. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahman. We'll see at the end, you know, the, you made a very uh, compelling point and make a case for microplanning. Now I have the pleasure to invite um, uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Tiffany Tiara from Indonesia. She is the director for uh, Communicable Disease Prevention and Control. Uh, Dr. Tiffany, please. Indonesia has been the champion for the first country to uh, introduce um, um, the subnational elimination framework. Uh, at the same time, I have, we have seen that it has not been translated in proportionate resource allocation, uh, even when the disease was highlighted. Please, uh, over to you to make a you know lesson learned from Indonesia for other countries. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Swaru. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Jakarta. I'm Tiara Pakasi. I'm representing our Director General who cannot, uh, who could not attend this uh, important occasion. So uh, I think uh, as you all have been aware that our country, Indonesia, is the most uh, archipelagic country. We have tropical climates and therefore uh, we have uh, a very good uh, area for the transmission of malaria. However, we are pretty lucky that we have a different level of uh, ferrite uh, trans level of transmission, and uh, and it is really suitable of having the subnational uh, elimination strategy uh, applied. And we have been applying this strategy since 20, 2009, sorry. And the first uh, uh, district uh, achieved elimination, I think it was in 2013. So, uh, uh, with this, I think I would like to highlight that uh, we do have this uh, independent uh, elimination uh, committee who are working, uh, helping us at the MOH and endorsed by our Minister of Health, like to validate, uh, to verify the, the data that is proposed by district who wants to be declared uh, uh, elimination, uh, malaria elimination. And uh, they also do visit the uh, field to, uh, to verify the data that has been uh, uh, submitted. I think with that, uh, it is uh, like uh, 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 independent and validate yeah, for, for having this uh, uh, status of uh, elimination. And after that, as reward, we also give the certificate uh, after it is uh, validated by the Ministry of Health. So uh, the, the mayor and the uh, region will uh, receive the certificate from the Minister of Health. So the second, I would like to highlight that we also uh, have the power of our community as the uh, long hands or, or how I should say, uh, helping, helping the health, uh, uh, health uh, workers in reaching the population that is uh, difficult to reach, yeah, as uh, presented also in Professor Aditama's uh, presentation. And also uh, like uh, in the Papua uh, province, especially the contribution of the community workers are very uh, of importance. And also the third, I think we also need to uh, acknowledge the contribution from the multi-sectoral or multi-stakeholders uh, above, uh, beyond health sectors, uh, such as uh, uh, for the environment uh, uh, changing yeah, from the uh, mosquito breed uh, places to mosquito free places. And it is the, the contribution by the multi-sectoral uh, beyond health. So uh, we are lucky that as of today, we have certified 347 out of our 514 districts. And we are aiming uh, as per our national roadmap to have all districts free in 2028 and all these provinces free of malaria in 2029. Despite the achievements, we do have challenges such as in uh, maintaining the skilled human resources, adequate financial resources, and also maintaining the strong commitment from the lead and, and the leadership of the national and local governments. And with that, we also uh, would like to uh, expect, uh, expect the, the contribution by WHO to play a significant role with us together to accelerate the progress of uh, malaria elimination in Indonesia. Thank you. I think together we can achieve malaria elimination timely. Back to you, Dr. Swaro. 
Hey, thank you, uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Tiffany, and for leading the region and setting example and drawing very good lessons. Uh, thank you. Uh, I now have the pleasure to invite from Thailand Dr. Prayuth uh, Sudhapit, who is the Deputy Director of Department of Vector Bone Disease uh, Control and uh, under Department of Disease Control, MOPH. Dr. Prayuth, please, you know, you have been leading the cross-border program, not only uh, in malaria, but also a very good example in HIV. And you have been one of the most advanced countries in particularly bordering districts in the whole region and for the whole world. Please, uh, we, uh, please, uh, you know, elaborate your experience and the applicability of subnational framework in your country. Dr. Prayut, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me begin with um, the goal of malaria elimination in Thailand. We uh, have the goal to uh, have zero in the case by 20, 2024 and uh, PF in the case by uh, 2023. Currently, uh, the Malay eliminations in Thailand um, have uh, significant progress. Uh, we have uh, reductions of all species, especially uh, Fanciferum. Um, this year, from uh, the January, we detect only 23 PF cases, and also um, active foci also reduce significantly. And uh, this year, we detect about 200 uh, active foci in Thailand. More cases occur in uh, along um, the international border. Um, uh, it, for example, Laos, Cambodia, Malaysia, and Myanmar. But um, the cases and active foci along uh, uh, Laos, Cambodia, and Malaysia have uh, uh, limited actually. But the most cases and um, active foci are detected along the Thai Myanmar border where we have a uh, conflict zone. So I think. Uh, from our experience, the, the most success for um, eliminations of malaria along the border is the, um, the implementation of both sides of both country. Uh, it's good. If uh, we have problem with another side of country, uh, then uh, the, uh, the implementations of uh, malaria elimination is difficult. Uh, for example, along the Thai Myanmar border, currently we uh, detect more than 50% of cases are migrants from other side. And uh, so, what we can do here in Thailand, we provide uh, community uh, interventions uh, like provide diagnosis and treatment along the border to detect cases. And uh, currently, uh, we implement sub-national verifications. <clears throat> and uh, uh, as of 2022, we have uh, 41 provinces that declare as malaria-free. And uh, we still have 36 provinces that aiming to accelerate malaria eliminations. Uh, but uh, for our country, malaria elimination definition is not only in the Kinat case, but also uh, prevention of uh, reintroductions. Uh, and this year, we developed uh, the sub-national uh, prevention of reintroductions pre uh, for the province. Uh, this to prevent reintroduction in the future when we reach uh, zero malaria uh, in 2024. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Proyut, for making an uh, excellent summary. And uh, I encourage all the, uh, all the uh, attendees of the meeting to go through the uh, you know, first country in the world to eliminate uh, mother-to-child transmission, how Thailand did this by addressing cross-border issues and by addressing popul uh, people from other countries. That's a very wonderful example could be applied to Malaysia. Having said this, let me make a quick summary. I think, you know, we learned the best practice from all these countries, wonderful example from Indonesia, India, Thailand, Bangladesh. And, um, and I see four activities are emerging, which is necessary, which is to develop a data framework 
which allows us to do uh, right, you know, burden estimation and uh, mapping to help micro plan. Number, number two is, you know, translating them into unit cost and resource need, because often the micro plans are good, but resources are not there and multi-sectoral response is not there. Number three is develop a framework for real-time monitoring at the highest level, uh, simultaneous with WHO. And finally, an uh, engagement plan for the marginalized group and the tribal people because in all the cross-border areas where the most problem is. Having said these three key stakeholder action needed from the countryside, each country to develop with its small milestone and each country plan and propose an RC agenda next year, uh, you know, to pass this, which become binding resolution for each country. Number two is for WHO to develop a framework based on these four action points and a lesson learned summary from already what has happened. Uh, a time bound, you know, a time bound milestone uh, and mobilize the donors. And finally, for the donors to align with a costed, uh, saturated plan to make this sub, uh, sub uh, national action plan uh, valid and actionable. Over to you, uh, Chair, and over to you, Suman, for your, uh, you know, for your uh, point taken uh, summary. Over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarkar and all the distinguished panelists. This was an excellent discussion with much to take away for thoughts and actions. So for our next discussion, I invite Professor Pratap Singha Sivanan, who is Secretary General Coordinator at the Southeast Asia uh, MEO Med Network and Senior Advisor, Department of Tropical Hygiene, Faculty of Tropical Medicine at Maidol University. He is joined by colleagues from AIPH University, India, country representatives from Bhutan, EPR, Korea, Maldives, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and our WHO colleagues. Uh, so over to you, uh, Professor Pratap. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suman, for your introduction. And I think that uh, in this session, we will have a panel discussion on the rationale and need uh, for addressing the challenge of imported malaria. I think this is, uh, uh, this is a very timely topic and is truly relevant for our region uh, in, uh, in the context of uh, malaria elimination. And as we know that many countries in our region are uh, already in the elimination settings, uh, as well as countries that are on the path to elimination. And some other countries uh, uh, will join uh, them very soon. And uh, these countries will face ultimately uh, the challenges, the threat and challenges of malaria resurgence or, re uh, or reintroduction by imported uh, malaria cases. And as we know also that malaria does not respect national borders which means that no country can achieve and sustain malaria elimination. So we cannot do it alone. We need uh, a regional collaboration. The persistence of uh, malaria in border areas, as well as uh, we would say more generally in the neighboring nations, has become a critical concern, uh, which is the topic of today. And also as an increasing number of member states of the Southeast Asia region, move closer to eliminating malaria while significant burdens of malaria persist in uh, others. So it's quite heterogeneous uh, uh, in malaria transmission. So there are many examples uh, today that we were going to exemplify and also set uh, and learn uh, the good example from Bhutan and India, Nepal and India, Bangladesh and India. I think Bangladesh and Myanmar, Thailand and Myanmar, Timor Leste and West Timor uh, and Indonesia. So therefore, uh, by focusing uh, on acceleration towards elimination in the periphery, along with the emphasis on high burden areas elsewhere, uh, larger areas of the high burden country could move closer to interrupting transmission to the benefit of uh, both countries or more than two countries. So our panelists who are participating in our discussion today are from uh, WHO headquarters, academic institution, and country representatives. We have uh, seven panelists and we have just only 30 minutes. 
So uh, we, I think, uh, uh, we'll have uh, about three point three and a half minutes for each speaker. Uh, please be specific to the point. And after your presentation, we will follow by some questions uh, to the country in order to uh, expand it. Okay. Uh, we also we will have uh, all this uh, followed. So the first of all, so first of all, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Elkan. Gasimov, uh, Head Elimination Unit, WHO Global Malaria, to uh, give us uh, the, the, uh, the set off on about the import malaria and, and malaria elimination. Uh, sorry, Dr. Gasimov, uh, please. Uh, yeah. Dr. Gasimov uh, has sent his apologies. He was not able to join. So we could move ahead. Okay. So sorry, I did not uh, have down those information. So uh, let's move to uh, Bhutan. Okay. Mr. Gobiel. Uh, Gabriel, uh, Program Analyst, uh, VDCP of Bhutan, would you uh, be the first one uh, to set off the stage? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I would like to thank WHO Regional Office for coordinating this high-level seminar to commemorate the World Malaria Day. I would also like to thank the organizers for giving, giving me an opportunity to speak. Professor Further, thank you so much, sir, for your question. Our initial expectation of cross-border collaborations uh, with our counterpart has been already initiated, especially with the government of India and the National Vector Bond Disease Control Program India. But before I answer your question, I would like to share a background why cross-border is uh, very important for us. Bhutan was in malaria elimination stage since 2013 onwards, with a case load below 100 in a country. Our cases are confined to very close to the international border, that too very sporadic in nature, and there is no onwards transmission from the single case that has been diagnosed. Uh, Bhutan border with the four Indian states, Assam, West Bengal, Sikkim, and Arunachal Pradesh. Our border with Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh are in high altitude areas, and then there is no risk of malaria transmission in that uh, border area. Uh, the border with West Bengal, yes, it is a very high uh, transmi transmissible region, but we could able to eliminate uh, malaria in that place. Uh, with, the, with the border with West Bengal since 2016 onwards, and we are able to sustain the elimination till yet. So <clears throat> the biggest problem that we have is with the border with Assam. Uh, uh, yeah, still uh, cases are there, about 70 to 80 persons of our malaria cases are with the border with the Assam, which is staged almost uh, 200 kilometers. Our counterpart, uh, National Vector Bond uh, Disease Control Program, Government of India, has been always supportive and helpful, both in terms of uh, funding and technical support to fight against malaria. However, we are not been able to operationalize malaria control and preventive activities across the border in a more coordinated effort. Uh, this has led continuous transmission in the border area, affecting both the population at both sides. I think uh, the turn, uh, turn, turn about, turnaround of the cross border has been initiated in late 2019, where WHO regional office and the global fund has initiated this cross border collaboration, followed by Kohati meeting on cross border elevation, where we could able to establish uh, some kind of uh, collaboration to, with the informal uh, social network established to share the information on the malaria. And in December 2021, uh, APMEN, APLAMA and the APMEN coordinated a high level meeting where the cross border has been highlighted as one of the most important elements for malaria elimination. Then in beginning in 2000, uh, this year, 2022, the SRCM Secretariat uh, has uh, coordinated uh, the, the cross border collaboration among the, 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 in the regions uh, that borders with the Indian, uh, India member state uh, that border with India. So we had a, a series of uh, meeting at the national level, program level and the state level, and the process is going on. And then we are hopeful that it will trigger down to the grassroots level. In principle, both countries has agreed the following activities. 
identification of five kilometers radius corridors on both sides of the borders and mapping of the health facilities in the area and then initiating the intervention in that particular areas in a more uh, coordinated effort. Then we also discuss on the convergence and synchronization of malaria control efforts, especially the IRS and LLI distribution on SAM period to have uh, the, the ripple effect of the, 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 the interventions. We also discuss on establish, uh, having the establishment of information platform for the malaria, both uh, the, at the national and the national and the at the, at the regional level. And we also discuss of having the joint vector surveillance once uh, once we have established collaboration at the grassroots level uh, in the at the local level. So these are the few points that we have already been discussed. And that now as SRCM as a main coordinator uh, would uh, will be soon having this uh, at the local level. So. Uh, uh, these are the few things that uh, we would like to highlight for Bhutan to have an elimination achieved and, and also for other countries to move forward for elimination. I think the cross-border collaborations uh, is one of the most important uh, for us uh, in achieving the, the, the elimination target. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, top girl, uh, for your uh, for highlighting, okay, the the cross-border uh, collaboration uh, between the neighboring countries like India, sharing uh, uh, the information and also uh, uh, the uh, 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 interventions, uh, resources, and also exchanging uh, a lot of uh, important issues uh, uh, between the countries, which is the highlight of the, of the uh, malaria elimination strategy. Uh, that going to be successful in the future. So I'm going to uh, move on to the second presentation uh, from Maldives, who, uh, which is the already country that have uh, eliminated malaria for several years. So they will be having uh, a lot uh, to share with us on uh, how to deal with the, the imported malaria cases. Uh, Mohamed uh, Najib, uh, Senior Community Health Officer from Maldives, please. Thank you, Honorable Moderator. Uh, as you as we know that Maldives is a water-bound nation with high rainfall and in this global sport of constant and increasing movement of humans as well as parasites. Keeping it malaria-free is an immense challenge mm -hmm. for this island-based nation. In Maldives, last malaria parasite was detected in 1994 and last vector was observed in 1991. We have received Malaria free certificate on the year 2015. Mm. Even though at present we don't have malaria vector, but increased globalization and urbanization, there's an additional threat of vectors like Anopheles stephensi being introduced. Entomological surveillance at port of entry is carried out to some extent and is a challenge due to scarcity of human resource and we need to strengthen the surveillance at these points. We have a public health officers in every ato, but vector surveillance entomological capacity is limited around the country. Currently, vector control is integrated for all vector-borne diseases. Since 1984, local malaria prevalence is zero. However, statistics of Health Protection Agency reveals an average of one imported case per year during the last 14 years. This value is significantly low, but extensively dangerous to our country. Every single imported case, is, case of malaria is, is alarming and an immense challenge for us. Therefore, proper surveillance at international ports is vital and it needs to be still strengthened. Since malaria is no longer a significant public health problem in Maurice, clinical management of imported cases could be a challenge, including procurement of antimalarials in short amounts, which is strictly only made available from national programs, especially if the case is resistant to antimalarial drugs. So 
briefly mm -hmm. and in general, sustaining the capacity in terms of human resource and training to maintain an adequate surveillance of both cases and vector and an effective clinical management of imported cases at all levels, including procurement of test kits and intermediaries. So this can be considered as the major challenges in preventing introduction of reintroduction of malaria to Morris. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, about Najib uh, for your uh, uh, presentation. So uh, I think uh, Maldives has uh, highlighted a very important point that uh, more than 10 years that since uh, they have uh, eliminated, eliminated malaria, but still uh, uh, there is uh, many challenges that uh, we still face. Uh, uh, is the urbanization, is a tourist destination, and also the in uh, the, the new vectors like uh, Anopheles stiff and uh, which may risk. So therefore, uh, we cannot uh, uh, stay put. We have to be vigilant all the time, okay, uh, with the capacity building continuous uh, surveillance and also the entomological capacity must also be uh, increased uh, uh, in order to uh, prevent the resurgence and reintroduction uh, of malaria in the area. So thank you very much for sharing with us about your experience. Now, uh, uh, next one, we would like to uh, move to uh, Nepal uh, by Dr. Shuman Ladas, Director Epidemiology and Disease Control Disease Division. Control. Yes, go ahead, please. Dr. Uh, Shuman, yes. Thank you, Dr. Pratap. Good afternoon from uh, Nepal. Uh, first, I would like to thank WHO uh, for this commemorative uh, seminar uh, on the occasion of this World Malaria Day 2022. And obviously, uh, there has been more than 70% decline in the total malaria cases in the last five years. And the malaria outbreak in previously no risk areas in the upper river valley in the mountainous region in 2017 made us rethink our strategy for malaria elimination. For this, the government has uh, the uh, commitment for the uh, increase uh, the uh, this uh, resources and uh, also has increased from the uh, previous um, uh, years for the elimination of uh, this uh, malaria and based on our experiences we have now expanded uh, and strengthened our surveillance networks as well and we have intensified our malaria case finding with the focus on migrants and mobile workers who are the main source of imported malaria and some Specific interventions are also there that we are being the malaria mobile clinic for the high risk areas. And the second, uh, recently we have uh, we have uh, uh, started the community based malaria testing in risk areas as well. And the third one is obviously uh, we have very large, very long uh, open border with uh, uh, India, and we have the point of entry health decks are there, and we have started the malaria testing. Uh, in those uh, health decks uh, as well. And another one is this, uh, we have also intensified the community engagement for addressing the uh, uh, imported uh, cases in the area from where the high uh, migrant workers are uh, there. So these are the, uh, these are the uh, activities that we are doing for these uh, imported uh, cases and the, uh, for the elimination as well. And the, some points that we want to uh, have, um, uh, want to strengthen the uh, countries with borders with Nepal play a significant role and can support to address the issues of imported malaria and reach towards the elimination target by 2025. We know that the import, uh, imported malaria only the uh, one country cannot uh, um, achieve without the, without the collaboration of the neighboring. So we need that, we have suggested that uh, there should be effective and coordinated cross-border surveillance and response, including planning and implementation for vector control activities, which are very important. And secondly, universal access to health prevention and promotion services in border areas and in high border areas as well for the people from across the countries. And third one is strengthened cross-border collaboration mechanism. Though it has been 
uh, well written in the this uh, malaria strategic planning but we have not strengthened till now we could not have strengthened this the formal or informal collaboration mechanism which can which provide the enabling environment for, for malaria elimination recently we have uh, we have done one collaboration uh, meeting uh, let's see what happened and the next targeted intervention for the migrant workers for prevent prevention of vector burn and other diseases so these are the uh, expectation uh, from the um, uh, the neighboring countries or we have go to jointly uh, to uh, eliminate the uh, malaria and to address the imported cases and with this i hope the recommendations from today's meeting will inspire us inspire and guide us all to collaborate further for cross border collaboration for malaria elimination that's all thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr shuman and uh, 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 your point is uh, uh, very well taken and and as we know that nepal is moving towards uh, malaria elimination country and you have stress and restress about the regional collaboration which is uh, extremely important and uh, and uh, you have also uh, uh, put into the speci specific issue on targeting and also uh, making a surveillance towards uh, the migrant population and also using the community engagement in identifying and also uh, to look for uh, the, the malaria cases uh, among uh, the migrant workers, which is a, a very good lesson learned for the other countries to follow. So thank you very much. Now uh, we move on uh, next to uh, uh, Timor-Leste. Uh, so Ms. Maria from Timor-Leste CDC, uh, uh, the head of the Department of CDC Ministry of Health. Maria, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Professor Patak. Um, good afternoon to everyone to the uh, Sierra country and also the HQ WHO member and uh, also to the country state member. And I'd like to thank to WHO for inviting us, uh, Timor-Leste, to share the experience on addressing the challenges, uh, especially in the last mile of the imported cases. So as we have uh, uh, presented by the WHO in the morning that Timor-Leste has a uh, significant reductions of uh, malaria in the country. And then we have no reported the indigenous cases since January, uh, sorry, since uh, June 2017, and also uh, maintaining the zero death due to malaria. So the success is uh, more admirable. And given the Timor-Leste that uh, share high porous border with Indonesia, West Timor, which is endemic for malaria. So, uh, well, the imported cases are reported recently concluded that vector control needs assessment, uh, anal uh, need uh, better analysis, and then uh, capacity building of the entomology in identifying the ecology and the bionomic of the vectors also revealed that so malaria has been uh, restricted and mainly around the international border area, same as uh, Bhutan. So the report of the notifying 14 disease cases in 2020 indicated that a uh, few indigenous cases are uh, reported and also introduced cases also reported. So this is during the pandemic COVID-19. Clearly alert and call for the strengthening vector control in the border area and having a greater cross-border cooperation uh, between Indonesia and Timor-Leste. However, in 2021, uh, uh, through the uh, uh, many intervention has been made. So we have not, uh, since now we have a zero report of malaria from January to uh, December in 2021. Um, we like to inform you also that uh, Timor-Leste, both country, Ministry of Health, has recently signed the extension of the MOU uh, for the framework which has been uh, agreed in 20, uh, 2019. And we look forward to uh, continue the uh, cross-border collaboration with uh, West Timor. However, so recently increases of the malaria transmission in that uh, 
Oikusi region, it is fragile and, and of the achievement. So uh, this is more significant uh, as Timor Leste is, uh, has reported uh, zero cases for last four, three consecutive year, was uh, agreed for the WHO certification and the elimination, which now seems we have to push back uh, for our elimination. So the bottleneck is, of course, like uh, Bhutan that uh, due to the movement of the people, uh, migrant and under control of the border in the, in the uh, particular area, especially the area in the border, and also unregulated um, uh, 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 border control. And then also uh, Timor-Leste in that part, we have a sharing of the uh, land for the farming, especially the people who are living in the border area. That's become a challenge uh, uh, in uh, uh, giving the transmissions of malaria uh, in those areas. So uh, one, uh, uh, the challenge we address here, uh, we uh, gave having uh, these important cases is that um, we have a dispute area uh, which is still on the process uh, has to be uh, uh, defined. So if this uh, still remains, so um, the cases might uh, will uh, still occur in that place. So um, despite of the, uh, the substantial effort to make the cross-border collaboration operational and the border malaria remains the issue and making the malaria-free status of Timor-Leste is vulnerable. So we are at the critical point in the fighting against malaria in Timor-Leste with an inside. So the way forward to reach the last mile of the malaria elimination so we'll include the sustainability, the sustaining political commitment and then strong uh, cross-border collaboration, which we have now uh, started and hopefully we will be implementing soon the framework. And then um, uh, we need to support uh, uh, technical support for the cross-border activity and then integrations of the uh, vector bondages, which is one of the uh, 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 challenges uh, need to be uh, improved and in uh, coordination, continuous multisectoral, and harnessing the technical innovation to eliminate malaria and ensuring the people and the community will continue engaged for the effort which we have uh, made so far. I think uh, that's all from uh, 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 Timor Leste statement on addressing the challenges of uh, imported cases in the country. Thank you and uh, give back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Maria. Uh, uh, we are very appreciative uh, of uh, uh, Timor-Leste because, uh, and you are on the path of malaria elimination because uh, I remember that a few years uh, ago, you have still have a lot of malaria and now you have achieved uh, 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 by reducing the incidence of malaria so low, okay, almost uh, and in some years is zero and then uh, recently, you have uh, faced a few challenges, and also you could uh, uh, taking uh, care of them uh, uh, very uh, efficiently. So I would like to congratulate you, you on these issues, and also you also stress on on the uh, uh, cross border collaborations, okay, surveillance and capacity building as a very important aspect. So uh, we move uh, next to Sri Lanka uh, to Dr. Kumudu. Uh, uh, Gandasekara uh, from Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka, and uh, sharing uh, the experience on uh, Im Im imported uh, uh, cases of malaria in Sri Lanka. Please, Sri Lanka, go ahead, please. We have been uh, since 2010 free from indigenous malaria. However, the risk of uh, Re-establishment is very much real due to the high malaria potential in the country. So as imported malaria cases continue to occur with increased travel with high burden countries, uh, we, it is a great threat for us and we have to take measures to prevent re-establishment of the disease. So in order to sustain the malaria free status, uh, we always carry out targeted but intensive surveillance and response measures and the anti-malaria campaign ensures standard case management and follow-up for all malaria cases. And also we have a very good information system 
with DHIS2 and Google Data Studio platform also that is linked to case management and also parasitological surveillance and entomological surveillance. So also for each and every case that is being detected, we conduct a case review monthly with an independent team and the case review committee identifies areas that need to be corrected in the management of each case. So also, uh, we are taking measures to ensure that the quality of the diagnostic service in the country is of good quality. So ensure, we ensure we carry out uh, quality assurance and quality control of the diagnostic service in the country for malaria. Then, uh, and however, when we talk about these measures, with its elimination, we have, sorry to say that malaria has become some sort of a forgotten disease among the clinicians and the laboratory staff. So we have to pay great attention to the capacity building of these categories, both in the public sector as well as in the private sector. So we continue so many training programs and competence assessments and awareness campaigns even during the POR phase. And recently the anti-malaria campaign has launched a creative awareness program uh, to the public health and health sector staff through a so, uh, the social media. And this is known as the Promise Initiative. And this is the world's first social marketing of malaria in a country that has eliminated malaria. So, and all these surveillance and then uh, awareness campaigns and also the training activities are possible due to the good health uh, infrastructure that is prevalent in the country and the functioning of the anti-malaria campaign, which is a specialized campaign in the Ministry of Health through the decentralized provincial health system, providing technical and operational guidelines to the provincial health staff also uh, through the dedicated staff at the anti-malaria campaign as well as at the regional malaria officers. And also we conduct monthly review meetings with the reg all the regional malaria officers and other relevant stakeholders. So we have strong collaborations with the relevant stakeholders, including the Global Fund and the WHO. And we have to mention the WHO supported procuring small quantities of essential drugs, anti-malaria drugs that has resulted in re uh, reducing the drug cost in the country, and also its assistance in maintaining quality assurance. So as the neighboring countries have high disease burden, Sri Lanka is at a constant risk. So we are always open to strengthen the regional cooperation. And if needed, we are ready to notify the country of origin whenever an important case is reported. And we are willing to provide any relevant information and assistance to any neighboring country that is needed for the elimination of malaria. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Kumudu. Uh, we are very proud of uh, Sri Lanka, always uh, set up uh, a very good example for the region. And uh, as uh, we can learn uh, from Sri Lanka that even after so many years of uh, 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 success in the malaria elimination, you still uh, uh, have to be always uh, aware of the, of the surveillance of their uh, uh, cases, although it's important and uh, case and also uh, set also the standard and quality of diagnosis and case management, and also uh, having a community involvement and also linking with the stakeholders who are exporting malaria uh, from different places uh, that come to Sri Lanka. So I think uh, the, uh, this is going to be a learning uh, a lesson for the countries that are going to go towards uh, malaria elimination that we have to maintain the capacity uh, for, for a long time. So therefore, this is a, 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 a thank you for your sharing of your this uh, experience. Now we are going to uh, go to uh, uh, the presentation and uh, uh, listen to the uh, very important uh, presentation by, by uh, uh, Dr. Padma uh, uh, is a Padma Shri Professor, Professor Dr. A.P. A. P. Dash. We haven't seen uh, you for quite a long time now uh, from the Blue H.O. Now you are the Vice Chancellor of APPH uh, University at uh, uh, Bhubaneswar and former Blue H.O. colleague. 
Very nice to see you, Professor Das. You still look very young and still uh, the same as I have seen you several years ago. So uh, I would like to welcome you and hear from you. Professor Thank Das, you please. Thank you very much, Professor Das. Indeed, very nice to see you after a long time. Now, at the outset, let me express my thankfulness to the CRO for giving this, me this opportunity to come over here and interact with you for a little while. As you all know, in border areas, malaria prevalence is often higher than the other areas due to the lower access to health services. Globally, cross-border importation of malaria has become a challenge to malaria elimination. Key to addressing the challenges is strengthening of surveillance. This could involve taking advantage of technological advances. As you all know also, parasites and vectors need no passport to cross the borders. To achieve malaria elimination, cross-border populations in the hotspots areas will need targeted intervention strategies tailored to occupation, age, and mobility status, etc. Furthermore, all stakeholders, including implementers, policymakers, and donors should support and explore the introduction of noble approaches to address these hard to reach populations with the most cost effective interventions. The emphasis should be on how to fund cross border and regional efforts to achieve malaria elimination in time. Border malaria is also associated with multi-drug resistance issues. All of us know about that. Meeting the strategic goals, including a 90% reduction in global malaria incidence and mortality rates by 2030 will require new approaches and greatly intensified efforts aided by new tools and better implementation of existing ones. Stepped up in <clears throat> investments is also very essential to achieve the goal. We have heard about the best practices from the countries, the issues related to subnational elimination and imported malaria. The highlights is that if we continue to do business as usual, we will not be able to change the trajectory of malaria elimination, as Dr. Kamini Mendes mentioned in her presentation. The high burden countries should have good surveillance in border areas which are generally difficult to access. This will prevent cases in near elimination bordering areas. There is a need to use innovative strategies to deal with this long pending problem of cross-border malaria. As such, the theme of malaria, World Malaria Day this year highlights the critical role of innovation in the high in the fight against malaria. Many developments have taken place in the past in the field of diagnosis, treatment, and vector control, like highly sensitive diagnostics, new ACTs, and vector control tools. All the present vector control tools are effective except the problem of insecticide resistance. The long-lasting impregnated nets and the IR indoor residual spray are to be used very judiciously. In certain areas, we use IRS using synthetic pyrethroids, and also there we use LLINs, which are impregnated with synthetic pyrethroids. So an integrated vector management should be implemented using appropriate vector control tools. Thank you very much. I think I have completed in time. Thank you. Much, uh, Professor Das. Uh, for in fact, you have summarized uh, so well. Uh, that I uh, need uh, not to uh, uh, retreat uh, again. So uh, uh, we will uh, now we will come to the uh, uh, some questions to to the panelist uh, so that uh, we will learn more. Okay, because we have a little time more. So therefore, I would like to uh, uh, go to uh, Bhutan first, uh, Mr. Topgel. Uh, as uh, I listen to you, and uh, you know that Bhutan is so close uh, to malaria elimination. In fact, uh, uh, you have almost uh, eliminated malaria for a few years uh, already uh, in the past, uh, yet it looks so far uh, due to active transmission uh, getting established at the border areas, which is the very important topic of today. And, uh, and also your country, 
uh, its border uh, with Assam of India, uh, and every now uh, and then uh, we see that there is uh, cases of imported malaria in the country, and also it can maintain uh, the indigenous transmission. So my question is, uh, what do you expect from your counterparts? Uh, what I mean is uh, 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 India, uh, on the other side of the border, which you have already uh, stressed some already the point in the beginning, to help in interrupting ongoing transmission on the other, other side so that uh, you can accelerate uh, malaria elimination in Bhutan. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, really, I think uh, for Bhutan, as I have already highlighted even in the statement, that our current situation of few malaria cases in the country are confined to the border, very close to the border. That too, also with the joint village, joint uh, satellite uh, towns, you know, and uh, close, close uh, settlement in the area. It's the main concern, actually. We are seeing a few cases of indigenous cases in, in some area within the range of the mosquito flying range. We don't know whether it is a vector importation of the parasite or whether we have an active, uh, I mean, the indigenous transmission in our area. But uh, this question, I think, uh, need to be studied more properly because we feel that uh, uh, if there is a onwards, uh, if there is an active transmission in our area, there will be a continue uh, kind of flow of cases in the area, maybe one or two, three or four cases in, in, in that particular area. But uh, in the area, we hardly see a single case and then there is no onwards transmission. So what we feel is that uh, unless we have a kind of cross-border cross collaborations uh, in the border areas, taking the both interventions uh, in both the areas together, I think uh, eliminate eliminations of the, the parasite uh, and within the mosquito flying range is very difficult. And uh, for that to, to happen, I think uh, the cross-border collaborations with our counterpart is very important. And India is also taking very seriously on that part. And they really want to see Bhutan achieve the target of elimination. And with that accelerated uh, kind of process, uh, we are now being able to uh, going down to the grassroots level to initiate this uh, kind of activities in the grassroots level. So I think uh, our expectation will fulfill once we have this kind of uh, intervention in the grassroots level, where the, the, the both countries are now targeting uh, in achieving the border malaria uh, uh, importations on both sides. So there, we have already agreed to having these uh, corridors of five kilometers radius in both the, the border area and then implementing the, the control and preventive activities more jointly in that particular areas to eliminate the, the parasite, I mean, the, in the areas and then stop the transmission across the border. So these are a few steps that we are taking. And then uh, probably we are looking for the, the, the more expert support from the Indian side because Technically, Bhutan uh, do not have much experts, uh, people in, working in the field. So the Indian has a kind of experience in the expertise in the malaria as well as entomology field. So we really want to collaborate uh, a kind of joint venture in this uh, intervention, especially on the vector, vector surveillance part as well as on the case, uh, case, case, case management front. So these are a few activities that we feel that need to be incorporated. And then instant uh, kind of uh, information sharing is very important, basically in the border area to stop the, 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 the onwards transmission. So unless we have this kind of uh, information sharing, I think uh, we would see a kind of uh, one or few cases uh, importation in the border area, which it will be very difficult for both the countries to achieve the elimination unless we uh, address the border malaria areas. So these Thank are you. things that I, yeah. I feel we need to work very closely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, now uh, 
go a little bit uh, because of your mentioning about the capacity on entomological uh, issues and all that. And Professor Das is here, and now he is uh, leading the academic institution. Uh, and then many countries, whether Nepal, okay, uh, Bhutan, and maybe uh, Timor Leste in the future, and some of the other countries. And then entomological uh, capacity is one of the aspects that everybody is talking about. Uh, uh, while in the face of uh, malaria elimination like this, uh, with the uh, uh, other kind of intervention, what will be the role of academic institutions in capacity building uh, in the uh, uh, in the countries that uh, towards the path of eliminations and some countries that already eliminate malaria, like in Maldives. Uh, for uh, other vector controls and and maybe the new uh, resurgence of malaria uh, in the urban areas. Okay, shall I, shall I address this question? Yeah. Okay, uh, you know, uh, as you know, Professor Pratap, since long, I since more than a decade, we have been talking about entomological capacity when we try to introduce integrated vector management in the region in every country. CRO developed many course curricula for integrated vector management orientation training for six months training, for six weeks training, and for two weeks training. And the Vector Control Research Center in Pondicherry is giving training best by best to all countries. So it is, it is necessary. It has been identified from for the last several years that the national entomological capacity needs to be strengthened and there need to be repeated training programs for the to strengthen national capacity in entomological aspects to implement IVM. So I think it is up to the country offices to organize the training program for the, for the entomologists in the respective countries in the academic institutions. There are many academic institutions who are now providing training in medical entomology or vector science and control. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, we will keep uh, this in mind. And now I would like to go to Maldives. Uh, very quick question to uh, Mohammed Najib, uh, uh, which you already mentioned that uh, there is uh, uh, urbanization and anopheles stigmatized issues. And uh, you also uh, have uh, some challenges. What do you think are challenges in preventing the reintroduction of malaria in Maldives? And uh, what are uh, things that you are doing now? Is Maldives still here? Uh, or oh, it's already gone? Maybe it's okay. We'll come back. Uh, if not there, I go to Nepal, Dr. Chu, uh, Schumann. Uh, ah, you're here now already. Uh, Dr. Najib, yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? The questions? Yes. Yeah. The challenge okay. is currently we, uh, the surveillance is continuous and uh, it is ongoing. And right now, uh, the Concerned Authority, Ministry of Health and uh, Health Protection Agency. They have uh, established a separate cell for the purpose and they have recruited some human resources and uh, there was uh, an entomological officer who is looking after the entomological uh, surveillance. So from HPA, they are doing the surveillance across the country and they are keeping a watch on all the ports, even the international ports, whether there is any uh, entrance of the vector. So recently they have uh, started training and they are conducting training in at all base areas. And they are training uh, health workers as well as uh, NGOs. And there are many other areas where they are uh, keeping a watch and they are trying to aware the communities for the purpose. So the currently surveillance program, they are strengthening the surveillance program across the country. Uh, thank you very much. As you know that uh, in the uh, elimination, once the, we use the surveillance as the core intervention, Okay, so it's extremely important. Uh, okay, so now uh, let's be go to uh, Nepal. Okay, Dr. Schumann, uh, as you know that Nepal has been successful in uh, bringing malaria situation 
in the country like Bhutan also uh, to a very low level and uh, mainly confined to Tarai area uh, of the border with India. Okay, uh, as you know that India is so large, so therefore it has a borders with so many countries. So, however, sporadic outbreaks in places uh, previously known as malaria-free uh, are uh, as uh, malaria-free are concerned that may push the goal of elimination well beyond the estimated timeline. I know that timeline is uh, important, and 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 that's why uh, my question to you is: What is the national malaria program uh, doing to achieve the elimination target on time and make the program sustainable? Because we have uh, a specific time, okay, for malaria elimination. And in your assessment, how can the neighboring country, India, assist in facilitate Nepal to achieve malaria elimination as envisage? I'm uh, putting this question uh, to different countries, uh, but it's all uh, uh, look like the uh, same aspect. So uh, in order to uh, know, OK, uh, where we are standing now, uh, Dr. Schumann, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Pratap. Uh, that uh, uh, there are two things. One is uh, this imported uh, for the imported cases, and the another one is this challenge of the uh, elimination. Uh, rightly, uh, that uh, for the imp uh, imported cases, we have uh, we have recently uh, the uh, meeting with the uh, Indian government, and the uh, this is. Uh, cross border issue uh, but the, there are no cases in the border areas but the cases come from the inner part of uh, india so we need some uh, robust in, uh, intervention and the information sharing as well and the, uh, that i have already talked the uh, the surveillance the uh, the uh, implementation this should be collaborated and the uh, the next uh, this thing like um, we have launched some specific programs for the elimination because we have uh, three three years only rest three years, three and a half years. Uh, the one is uh, this mobile clinic that we have. Uh, if there is any uh, in the high risk for the high risk areas, we have the mobile clinic. We send the mobile clinics for the uh, the um, um, find or to find out the cases suspected cases. And the another one, as I already said, the community based uh, testing. We have already. Uh, recruited uh, the uh, human resources uh, and sent to the community and uh, will uh, near uh, soon train them and uh, let them to have the community based testing uh, for in the high risk areas and um, the uh, for the suspected cases and the, another one is this uh, malaria testing as i have already uh, mentioned earlier the in the point of entries we have 13 uh, point of entries health desks in the in the Indian border uh, borders, and where we have uh, also added the health uh, health uh, workforce for the additional work, and we have uh, recently we have uh, the uh, some like ten cases we have um, uh, diagnosed in the uh, point of injuries health test, and there we have uh, the uh, additional resources as I have already said the additional uh, human resources are there, and they will do uh, the COVID test as well as the uh, malaria test uh, uh, also. And the uh, last one is the community engagement. We have uh, the strong belief in the community eng engagement. Without the community engagement, we cannot uh, succeed because the environmental things and the early uh, seeking of uh, the treatment, the community you know, awareness and engagement is the most important. And the, another thing was rightly Bhutan has al uh, already said that the uh, the, uh, for the the entomological survey we have to have the uh, strong health workforce but uh, and the, we have already talked with, we we are poor in the entomological uh, health workforce so the we have already talked with uh, the country office who country uh, country office to arrange the entomological basic uh, uh, training for the health workers in the peripheral setting where the cases are uh, from uh, the high risk areas. So these are the uh, strategies that we have uh, um, planned and uh, we are um, going for these things to eliminate the uh, malaria uh, in uh, time. That's all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, already uh, discussed a lot today. And uh, before I'm sending uh, Back to uh, Dr. Suman, I would like to uh, say that uh, that we have uh, listened after listening uh, to several uh, our member states and also the experts. Uh, we uh, 
we of course we could say that imported malaria is a critical obstacle uh, to achieving malaria elimina elimination and it enhances the vulnerability of a country uh, uh, for uh, of malaria resurgence and reintroduction so this is very clear that's why uh, countries that have become uh, malaria free uh, face a new challenge uh, all those countries also on the path of malaria elimination uh, on how to prevent malaria, uh, uh, imported malaria, and also that would lead into reintroduction. So therefore, uh, the experts have mentioned, and then the countries also mentioned that improved strategies to identify high-risk uh, importation groups okay, will help targeting specific interventions. So we need to be have a specific strategies and interventions for these uh, imported uh, uh, migrants and uh, uh, those people who are going to uh, carry the par parasite uh, across the border. And therefore, uh, uh, every country's mentioned regional collaborations uh, is important. But uh, we have to take into uh, consideration collaboration is complex and also difficult to sustain. Therefore, we have to make a very strong commitment Although it's difficult, we have been talking about regional collaboration for so many years, uh, but still we repeat and repeat uh, the same thing. And then, but we feel that is extremely important and it's needed. And it's also very important component to overcome the existing challenges of uh, importation of malaria. And also uh, surveillance uh, need to maintain the a capacity and the quality of uh, diagnosis and also management. Although the incidence of malaria in any country, uh, in, uh, in the country in our region will be zero someday, uh, but still we need, we, we need to maintain uh, that capacity because uh, there will be importation and exportation from some uh, other countries so that we need to know how to diagnose, how to manage, okay, and how to identify uh, many issues related to malaria. So thank you very much for all the panelists for your excellent uh, contribution. And we have learned a lot from uh, the member states. And uh, we hope that how we're going to take this uh, into something that uh, going to make it happen uh, uh, in the real situations. So I'm going to send uh, back to you, Dr. Suman. Thank you very much uh, uh, to everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished panelists and Professor Pratap. I fully agree with you that this was again a very rich discussion with takeaways for all of us as we commit our, recommit ourselves to renewed efforts to eliminate malaria in the Southeast Asia region. Now we are coming to the close of this seminar. On, on behalf of our regional director, Dr. Poonam Khedrapal Singh, I would like to make a few closing remarks. I quote, Excellencies, distinguished guests, partners, participants, colleagues, and friends. It has been a privilege to host you for this World Mal Malaria Day seminar, the outcome which I am most pleased at. Today, Excellencies have made a bold statement of intent, renewing region-wide commitment to fulfill the 2017 Ministerial Declaration on Accelerating and Sustaining the Malaria Elimination. I thank and commend you all, their excellencies and partners, for it is the steadfast commitment and steely resolve you have shown over so many years, including throughout the COVID-19 response, which has made this possible. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, no single tool is available today that will fully solve the problem of malaria. We must therefore make targeted efforts to harness innovation, to reduce disease burden and save lives. Theme of today's commemoration. Today, WHO is calling for increased investments and innovation that bring new vector control approaches, diagnostics, anti-malaria medicines and other tools to speed the pace of progress against malaria. As you have heard, we have several key areas of focus. First, expanding access to existing tools, second, stacking, stepping up innovation, third, strengthening country ownership, fourth, tailoring response to local settings with a focus in large countries on subnational elimination, fifth, 
improving surveillance systems, especially in difficult to reach and border areas, and sixth, ensuring resilient and equitable health systems. I thank excellencies for your interventions and express my deep gratitude to officials from ministries of health for your efforts to maintain essential malaria services throughout the COVID-19 response. I thank partners and friends for your ongoing solidarity and support, which continue to facilitate the region's world beating progress. I thank moderators, presenters, and panelists whose interventions have been deeply insightful, brimming with best practices and innovative ideas. You are all aware in disease elimination, the last mile is almost always the most challenging mile, but with increased and equitable access to existing tools and increased investments in emerging tools, I'm certain that together we can reach our destination of a malaria free region by or before 2030. I thank you once again and look forward to our onward journey together." Unquote. So thank you everyone again for joining in this commemorative seminar and with your continued efforts to eliminate malaria in the Southeast Asia region. Now I propose to close this session for today. Thank you.